Hi, this is Gordo from Manwa City. The story begins on the streets where a fair is being held, and our protagonist, a 14-year-old boy named Wo, is satisfied with what he's gathered. Now that he has what he needs, he has to find somewhere to sleep for the night. Wo is an orphan who aimlessly roams the land. As he makes his way out of the fair, he runs into a mysterious man. Wo is afraid as he feels this is a dangerous man. His intuition was correct as Wo wakes up in the darkness. There isn't a single ray of light. He tries to move, but he quickly realizes he can't. He can't muster any strength to get up. He starts shedding tears as he tries to figure out how he ended up in this situation. All he can remember was his encounter with that mysterious man earlier. He remembers the man saying he looks useful. Wool figures out he must have something to do with why he's there. He doesn't recall making any enemies, so he concludes the man must have some sort of goal. Wool's not sure how much time has passed, so he tries testing his memory. Though he was an orphan, he can remember his age, his name, and the names of both his parents. At this point, he's been in the dark so long, he doesn't even know if he's awake, and he begins to cry. He's scared and lonely, and doesn't know how much longer he'll have to suffer. Wool hasn't even had anything to eat, and starts to believe he will either die of starvation or insanity. He wonders if the man's plan was for him to die of starvation. Wool starts crying again, as he feels he has not done anything to deserve this torture. But suddenly, Wool gets a sensation in his hand, and he can't believe it. He finally has some movement, and is also having an easier time breathing. His bodily senses are returning. He can smell the damp air and feel the cold ground. This leads him to conclude he's underground, and off into the distance he can hear water. Wool tries to gather the strength to move his body so he can drink some water. He fights through the paralysis and begins crawling towards the water he hears. Wool knows he has to fight to survive. He finds his inner strength and keeps crawling. Wool finally reaches a stone wall where he heard the water coming from. There's a small stream of water coming from the wall and Wool slurps up what he can. However, he still can't see in the dark and accidentally slices his finger on one of the rocks. Feeling defeated, Wool falls to the ground and passes out. As he lays on the ground, he wakes up as he senses someone's presence. But what Wool sensed is a hallucination of himself. His conscience is asking him why he's fighting so hard to survive. It asks, what's so great about your life for you to be struggling so much? Just give up, it says. If you give up, you will be at peace. This gets Wool thinking if he'll really be at peace if he were to just let it all go. But he doesn't think so. He's going to survive. His conscience tries to tell him he's just wasting his strength. But Wool knows he won't be at peace if he dies like this. He wants revenge on the one who did this to him. Wool decides to fight to stay alive and it will all be worth it once he gets his revenge. His conscience asks if he's sure he wants revenge and Wool shouts yes. His conscience succeeded as Wool just needed a little push to not give up. Wool fights to sit upright and approaches the stone wall again. He feels the moss on the wall and tries to eat it. The moss tastes terrible, but he doesn't feel sick from it, so he goes back for seconds. Wool is willing to do whatever it takes to survive. He needs to keep reminding himself so he doesn't quit. Wool now has the energy to stand and tries walking around the room. According to his measurements, the space he's in is roughly 9 square meters. As he paces the room, he hears an iron door opening. Wool tries to call out for help, but he sees a shadow of someone leaving him food. He gets a whiff of the food, and though he can't see it, he smells the fish, pork, and tea leaves. Wool received a few variations of leftovers and guesses there's more than one person involved. There must be five or more people trapped along with him for a specific purpose. Wool just can't figure out why, but he can't hold off any longer and devours his plate of food. He'd much rather be eating scraps than that moss he had earlier. Now that he's done eating, he has to come up with a plan. Four months have passed, and Wall has taken this time to increase his strength. They provide him with food once a day and never say a word. He has yet to see a glimpse of a possible escape. He thought he would go insane in a situation like this, but his eyes are beginning to adapt to the darkness. Wall is now able to see fragments of the space around him. Sometimes he wishes he couldn't, though, as he finds he doesn't live there alone. Wool notices something from the corner of his eye and assumes it's just more insects. But little did he know it was actually a snake. The snake gets a hold of Wool's arm and begins hissing. The snake looks up at Wool and bites into his arm. Wool shrieks in pain as the venom stings his flesh. His whole body is beginning to feel like it's on fire. The pain is unbearable, but all Wool can do is lay on the ground and suffer. Wool's meal arrives and he hopes eating will replenish some of his health. He refuses to let himself die no matter what. Time passes and Wool is faced with the snake once again. 
Wolf feels his body changed during the detoxifying process. One improvement he noticed was his vision. He can see things in front of him more clearly now. Wolf sticks his hand out towards the hissing snake as he believes the snake bite may have made him stronger. He's heard of stories like these before. Wool hopes he can become resistant to the snake's venom and potentially gain a weapon, so he allows the snake to bite him. Once again, he feels like his body is on fire, but he notices the pain isn't as bad as the first time. Wool stares into the eyes of the snake as its eyes have degenerated from the darkness. Though its eyes are bright, it's an exceptional hunter that uses its stealth to consume its prey, sometimes even using sound to incapacitate its prey. Though they get a bad rap, snakes are not greedy. After they finish their meal, they don't make the mistake of chasing their prey away by intimidating them. The snake slithers away, leaving Wool with a new attribute. Suddenly, the ground begins to shake and Wool can't believe what's happening. The door has opened. Wool rushes to the door and sees more rooms down the hall. He peeks into one of the rooms and gets a big whiff of rotting flesh. Wool analyzes the body and assumes the person is around his age. He also wonders if it's the same for the other rooms. Wool makes his way down the hall and is once again faced with a door. The handles and bolts were removed, but he's able to push the doors open. And on the other side of that door, he sees an estranged boy and girl. Without saying a word, he walks past them and searches through the additional rooms. He sees more corpses and the girl finally asks who Wool is. She asks him where he came from as she can't see who Wool is in the dark. Wool introduces himself and says he was trapped in the adjacent sector. Wool asks for their names and she says her name is Yeo and the boy's name is Song. Wool doesn't need to know more and demands they follow him. He says there are probably more places like this. And a few meters down, he runs into another door. They decide to follow him and on the other side of that door is another group of people. They are all shocked to see each other, but Wool notices there were fewer people who starved to death in this sector. The people in this sector opted to take their own lives instead. He also notices there were more bowls of food here than where he was. Wool tries to think of why they would be discriminating between the sectors. Yeo calls for Wool's attention and says this group was trapped around the same time as them. They continue walking and reach another area underground with a door. Wool opens the door and they are blinded by the light. They think they're about to go outside at first, but then they realized they're being blinded by a torch. But once their eyes adjust, they cannot believe what they see. It looks like an underground village. They walk to the structures and see no one's inside. Wool concludes it must have been made in a hurry because the structures are flimsy. As Wool tries to figure out the purpose of this village, one of the girls from the new group calls for him. Her name is Min. She says she'll be in his care from now on. Min gets closer to Wool and asks if his eyes were always like that. There are no mirrors in this village, so Wool is not sure what she's talking about. She tells him his pupils are red and he figures they must be from the snake bite. Min wants to know what Wool is thinking about, but he won't share any information. This doesn't stop her from talking, and she tells Wool he's different from the others. Yeo interrupts and asks what they're doing. Min says they're just talking, and Yeo proceeds to say the others have decided to group up. Yeo asks if Wool is going to stick with them, but Wool isn't sure he wants to group up with anyone just yet. Yeo and Song get offended, but Wool says right now just isn't the right time for him. She has no choice but to accept Wool's decision. Min, on the other hand, is eager to join the group, but Wool knows they've been isolated for too long. There's no way their cognitive thinking is in the right place. Wool walks away and decides to just watch from afar. Watching from afar, Wool notices several cliques have already been formed. There's a group with Yeo and Song leading, a group with Kang leading, a group with Jung leading, a group with San leading, and then there's Wool, a kid who doesn't belong in any group. The other groups are talking and they're wary of Wool. They believe he might have killed everyone else in his sector and that's why he doesn't want to join a group. Wool doesn't have any mind to pay to those guys though and walks towards one of the walls. He thinks that this underground lair couldn't have been built that long ago with the amount of moss on the walls. This could only be the work of someone extremely wealthy. Suddenly, a hole begins to open in the ceiling and everyone looks up. A basket is descending from the ceiling. The basket reaches the ground and it's full of food. A few of the others try to dig right in, but Yeo stops everyone. Yeo says they should try to evenly distribute the food. And before anyone says another word, Wool says he needs his share too. Wool reaches in for his share and Jung stops him. 
Jung says no one may take food from the basket without his permission. Little does he know he just made a big mistake. Wo pulls his hand back and gouges Jung's eyeballs. Everyone is in shock as Wo slams Jung to the ground. Wo dares Jung to say something to him again. But all Jung can do is scream in pain. Wool isn't backing down now and digs his fingers in deeper. If the others weren't afraid of Wool, they definitely are now. Yeo asks Wool nicely to let go of him and at first Wool refuses, but Yeo promises that no one will touch his share of food. Wool gets up and stares down at Jung. Wool grabs his share of food and walks away. Time passes and Wool still watches from afar. As he's eating, he feels they're being tested right now and that they'll continue to be tested until the capturer's goals are met. Yeo approaches Wool and asks how he's been. Wool knows he has no friends here but tells Yeo he's been watching them. Wool knows how important Yeo is to the others. She eats the least after securing the most food for her group and she stands out most among the other leaders. Yeo asks Wool if he still sleeps in his dark room alone. Wool has been because he's trying to grow more tolerance to the venom. The snake bites are no longer painful to him. As he's talking to Yeo, the ceiling opens and here comes their meal. But when the basket drops, they're all confused. They've only been sent a small portion of food. Yeo can't believe it, but this is exactly what Wool was waiting for. It begins, he thinks to himself. The story continues and the lack of food has started a war. Mac is a boy who survived the final sector. He's a member of Yeo's group. He was the smallest of the group and pulled his weight through his sheer tenacity. But unfortunately, Mac was found lifeless. Yeo's group took the loss hard, but everyone knew he died because he was the weakest. Yeo and Song vow to avenge Mac's death. They plan to do so in the same exact way. Wool knows the weakest of another group will be eliminated next. After Mac came a member from San's group. This was still just the beginning. Every night, someone was found lifeless. Someone from Yeo's group, someone from Jung's group, someone from San's group, and someone from Kang's group. All trust was gone and everyone became a savage. Meanwhile, Wool doesn't have to worry about the food shortage because he'll always have his secret moss. He still hasn't gotten used to the taste, but he's willing to do whatever it takes to survive. So far, the others haven't made their way to Wool's dark room. But this is about to change as Wool hears voices coming from down the hall. He senses at least four of them, and he knows their intentions. No one walks through the dark for nothing. Jung and a few members from his group are plotting to eliminate Wool. Jung feels this is the perfect time to take revenge. But as they were walking, one of Jung's members felt a sharp pain in his leg. He falls to the ground as the snake slithers away. His body could not withstand the snake's venom, and he passes away quickly. Jung gets angry and begins shouting for Wool. Wool sneaks up behind one of the members and puts him in a chokehold. Jung is even more furious now and commands Wool to let go of his friend. Wool contemplates whether or not it'd be a good idea to take his life for a second, but then he proceeds to snap his neck. Wool has eliminated all of Jung's men and Jung finally rushes at him. He comes up empty with every attack and loses Wool. Wool sneaks up behind him and says he won't be taking just one eye this time. Jung scampers a little bit but asks Wool to wait. He tries to negotiate with Wool and offers to join forces. This confuses Wool, but Jung argues Wool won't be able to survive much longer without him. Jung senses Wool doesn't like that offer and counters with agreeing to be his minion. Wool approaches him and says there's no way he could trust him. Jung tries to defend himself one last time, but Wool doesn't care. Wool crouches down and releases a huge uppercut on Jung. He proceeds to put Jung in a chokehold and he chokes him out. Wool says to himself, the reason he took Jung's life is because he feels that he is still too weak. After Wool's encounter with Jung and his confidants, the rest of his group was disbanded. The other leaders knew it had to be Wool's doing. The leaders discuss and wonder how strong Wool could be. The one thing they know is they don't want to be his enemy. San continues to discuss with his group how far the problem has gone. There's no solving the distribution of food. People are killing to secure food. In the end, everyone has become a murderer. And they know, now that Wool has taken out Jung, no one will touch him. San turns to his group and orders them not to even think about doing anything to Wool. There's nothing more terrifying than someone with nothing to protect. San's group understands his reasoning. Then, another member of the group comes running. He says two kids from Yale's group have been banished and they have a potato. The boy says they have to hurry before they eat it. 
San can't believe what they're about to do for a potato, but he tells everyone to get ready. San and his group head over to the red house and see the pair with their potato. The group can't wait to move in as they are apparently willing to do anything for a potato. San orders them to attack. The pair sees the group rushing at them and they try to run, but something feels off to San. With their position, they're at a disadvantage. One of the kids holding the potato sends out a signal by whistling, and out come the members from Yeo's group to attack. San shouts for his group as they get whacked. San tries to get his group to retreat as they have fallen into a trap, but behind San are more members rushing in on him. San is circled and out comes Yeo and Song. They know they have the potential to reduce the amount of mouths to feed right now. San begs they spare his life at least. Yeo says she'd like to, but they can't afford that much food. San gets worried, and Yeo says he would have done the same if he were in her position. Yeo turns away and orders her team to eliminate them all. As she walks away, she looks up and sees Wool still watching from afar. Wool has learned some of Yeo's tactics. Battles using terrain, various shortcuts and tricks, and building placements which make infiltration impossible as long as there is competent security. Yeo just used this area exactly how those who made it intended it to be used. Wool believes they're trying to use them in a terrain like this someday. And if there's a large house like this, that means this is the manner of a large clan of a very influential figure. The consequences will be massive if they attack this place recklessly. Wool concludes that's why they're using them. They are tools they can throw away after using once. They were thrown into hell and their nature has been demolished. They are being raised to be assassins. After eliminating San and his group, members from Yeo's group are rejoicing. They are happy to be on Yeo's team, and Yeo believes no one would dare mess with them now. But from afar, Min is upset. She's upset everyone has gotten so used to murder. Min doesn't understand how they could eat so freely with blood on their hands. Meanwhile, the ceiling begins to open up. Everyone is surprised as this delivery is a little earlier than usual. Yeo orders her group to secure as much food as possible. She's ecstatic as she feels they will finally have enough food to fill their stomachs. But she notices Wool from the corner of her eye. He's not as excited as everyone else and seems weary of something. And when Yeo looks back, she sees why Wool had that look on his face. Instead of a basket of food, masked men have jumped down from the hole. Everyone's confused for a second, but then the masked men immediately start beating them. As everyone's getting beat, Wool lays down and takes cover. He decides not to make a move because he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. Wool then notices the real ones that are commanding the masked men. The real ones halt the beating and the leader introduces himself as the first sword. He announces to the kids that their lives are now on his hands and there are no exceptions. One of Yeo's members tries to protest and instantly suffers the consequences. Wool grimaces as he knows things are about to change. Later on, the real ones are meeting behind closed doors in the village. They are discussing curse poison. When you place poisonous organisms into one jar, they will eat each other until only one remains. The last one remaining possesses the most potent poison. The real ones are trying to figure out the child in the group with the most potent poison. The first sword asks which one of the kids is worth paying attention to, and his associate, the second sword, responds, Yeo. She leads the largest group and has the greatest influence over the others. If they do not crush her spirit, she will become much harder to deal with in the future. The first sword demands that Yeo receives special attention. He doesn't want her to even dream of a rebellion. The second sword says, Song and Kang are also worth paying attention to because of their outstanding martial arts. Then the first sword asks of the sole survivor from Sector 1, Wool. The second sword notifies him that Wool is still alive. The first sword is impressed as Sector 1 had the least amount of food and the poorest conditions. He wants them to pay very close attention to Wool as well. As the meeting ends, the first sword thinks to himself how there are only six years left to complete their mission. The Blood Shadow group was given an assassination mission with a duration of 7 years and a reward of 500,000 yang. The only condition was to not leave a single trace related to the Blood Shadow group behind. For the next round of training, one of the masked men announces the group's next objective. He says the one who reaches the flag at the top of the house the fastest will receive a 2 hour break. 
and the one who reaches the flag last will be taught what true hell is. The race was on. The merciless days continued for the trainees. Their days were filled with non-stop training. They had to do whatever it took to survive, especially if they wanted to see the outside world again. And of course, the winner of the race was Yeo. The real ones discuss the challenge from afar. They know Yeo's intelligence is outstanding and her guts are top-notch. The first sword asks about Wool, and the second sword reports that Wool is average. He hasn't shown anything that distinguishes him from the rest. This surprises the first sword, but he wants them to keep watching Wool. Later on, Yeo approaches Wool. She's confused as to why he's still reviewing the thunder-splitting cultivation technique. Though the instructors are no longer making them read about the technique, Wool felt like reviewing it anyways. Yeo doesn't see the point and heads to bed. Wool recalls the lesson from the real ones. They said the thunder splitting cultivation technique is a technique that they should be able to learn in three months. If they acquaint themselves with the first process, their body will be reborn as one that can feel chi and accumulate internal energy. Wool feels that the others along with the instructors don't grasp the full concept of the technique. Since it's not humanly possible to physically split thunder, the concept may be referring to the speed of your thoughts. Wool thinks if he can learn the technique with this interpretation in mind, he should be able to gain something different than he has already, but he still must never show how much he's learned. He cannot stand out for being too exceptional or too lacking. Everything has been going according to plan until Wool is forced to dodge a blade going for his throat. Wool can't believe one of the other trainees actually tried to kill him. Wool asks why he's doing this and Yoke responds saying he wants to have some fun. Wool considers taking him up on his challenge as the instructors seem like they couldn't care less. Wool draws his blade and Yoke rushes at him. Wool dodges every attack and is surprised by the amount of effort Yoke is putting into this fight. He won't give up the fight and Wool has had enough. Wool begins countering and the instructor is now impressed. But Yoke wants Wool's best effort and now Wool is left with no choice. Wool drops his knife and kicks Yoke right in the chest. As these two are fighting, the first sword is discussing with the second sword how fast the group has improved. The second sword thinks they only need five years instead of seven. But the first sword is disappointed with how much his second sword has underestimated their target. Their target is the man who possesses the most talent in all of Sichuan. The first sword wants their trainees pushed even harder. Back to the fight, we see Wool completely manhandling his opponent. Wool snaps his arm and the boy drops down in tears. The real ones wait to see what happens next and Wool does nothing. Now, one of the masked men approaches Wool and asks if he did this. Wool replies yes and a sword is instantly drawn to his neck. Wool didn't even see the sword coming and was shocked that a human could move so quickly. Wool is panicking as he wonders if he did something wrong. But the masked man pulls his sword back and says to Wool, an assassin must never leave a trace behind under any circumstance. Leaving a trace by breaking an arm like that is nothing more than letting your opponent know of your identity. He wants Wool to keep this in mind for the future. Wool lets out a huge sigh of relief as the masked man walks away. Six years later, one of the masked men is walking through the village. He's looking for the trainees as their objective is to hide from him. He spots one and warns him that he'd be dead if this were real. He moves on to search for more. The trainer knows no matter how much they've learned, an inexperienced assassin's turtle breathing technique is bound to be noticeable. He easily spots another and that's another failed test. He continues walking as his goal is to find the last person in this zone. The masked man scans the area but he can't find anyone. He feels someone may have made a mistake and said there was an extra person in this test. He calls for someone to come out if anyone remains. And to his surprise, right next to him is Wool. Wool has clearly passed this test and asks for a break. Wool is granted his break but the trainer is still in disbelief. Wool returns to the house and finds Yale and the others. Yoke is excited to see him and asks what he's doing there. Wool is annoyed by the different faces Yoke makes and tells him he's going to forget what his real face looks like one day. Yoke says it doesn't matter as they'll never leave this place anyways. But Yeo interrupts and says the quality of the food has been getting better. She believes they'll be given their mission soon. The story continues and we see the first sword exhausted and maskless. He thinks about the progress that has been made in the last six years in the cave. 
They've raised 30 out of 300 people into assassins and they could probably take his life at any point with how well they've been trained. He feels his death is approaching and gets emotional. Then, through the door, come the second and third sword. They ask the first sword why he has his mask off. He says it has become too constraining after six years and allows them to remove their masks as well. They gather at the table and rejoice over how their time in the cave is coming to an end. The first sword then asks for an update on the performance of the trainees. The second sword reports that they have exceeded expectations. Some are even stronger than the instructors. He says it's too much of a waste to throw them away after one use. But the first sword says they have no choice that was one of the mission's conditions. He wants to begin the final stage and places three journals on the table. They gather the trainees and announce that three of them must learn this martial art technique and the other 27 must assassinate the three that have learned the technique. This sends uncertainty through the group. The masked men announce this is their final training. Once this training is completed, they will not force any more until they leave this place. The group questions if this is really true and Wool thinks hard about his next move. The ones who learn that martial art will have a target on their backs and that technique is probably so much more advanced than what they've already learned. He gets greedy and is the first to volunteer. Yeo is shocked and asks Wool if he really wants to be the scapegoat. Wool replies and says only time will tell if he's a scapegoat or a wolf. Yeo warns Wool to be careful as he's now everyone's main target. Time passes and we see the second of the three to learn the martial art go down. After Wool elected to learn the technique, no one else volunteered and the group was forced to draw lots. Song feels bad about what he just had to do but he had no choice. Wool is the only survivor left out of the three that had to learn the technique. Song returns to the others and Min asks about Wool. It's been a while since they've seen him and wonder if he escaped outside. Yeo doubts it and says the last she saw Wool was when they were training together a few days ago. Yoke suggests taking out the instructors as that may be easier than eliminating Wool. Song agrees but believes the real ones may have placed some sort of restriction on them. Yeo says they can worry about restrictions later and need to focus on finding Wool first. They head out of the cave and watching them the whole time was Wool. He's surprised to hear that they thought about going after the instructors instead of him. Wool realizes the instructors may be pursuing the others and there's no way they didn't monitor that conversation. He thinks now is his chance to find the objective of the real ones. Wool makes his way to the base of the real ones. The base is heavily guarded but it's not something Wool can't get through. Wool knows that if he combines the turtle breathing technique with the thunder splitting technique, he can move while erasing his presence. Wool walks right past the guards without any issue. He reaches the deepest point of the base and assumes that what he needs is in this room. Wool opens the door and walks right in. He begins searching for any clues to discover any secrets. Then, he finds a golden tube. He unrolls the scroll and finds the terms to their mission. They are to assassinate Wu Gunsang within 7 years for a reward of 500,000 yang. He is shocked and wonders how great Wu Gunsang could be for them to raise assassins for 7 years. He wants to know how taking the lives of 270 people is worth this man's one life. Wool then hears someone coming and knows he has to leave quickly. The first sword is making his way down the hall quickly. As soon as the first sword barges in, he can tell someone was in the room. Wool tried his best to clean up, but it was sloppy. The second and third sword enter the base and run into the first sword. The first sword says someone has infiltrated their base and they must find them before they escape. They try to think of who could have done this, but then they realize that no one is as gifted as Wool. But they are clueless and don't even know Wool is hiding right above them. They are astonished that Wool would have the guts to infiltrate their base when everyone else is after him. They discuss punishing Wool but are afraid of a possible rebellion. The first sword says he has no choice but to use the hell flute. The second sword is shocked and says that's supposed to be a last resort restriction. The first sword asks if they are on board with the plan and the second and third sword agree. Shortly after, the first sword stands at the edge of the cliff. The trainees have no idea what's about to happen as they are still searching for wool. No one can find him, not even their best trackers. Suddenly, they hear the sound of an instrument. The sound sends a sharp pain through their bodies. They all fall to the ground and scream in pain. As they lay on the ground crying, here comes wool. He feels no pain as the others feel that their bodies are on fire. Wool concludes that they have now activated the restriction. Wool looks around and sees everyone else in pain. He wonders why he's the only one pain free. 
Wu wants to figure out the cause and decides to use internal energy infusion on Min. It's an extremely dangerous act, but it won't collide as much since Min has also learned the thunder splitting cultivation technique. Wu performs his analysis on Min and sees no issues with her internal energy. He continues to search for any differences between them. They share the same food, same environment, and same martial art. Then it hits him. Poison. The restriction has something to do with poison, and now it makes sense why Wu feels no pain. He's acquired a resistance to poison after being bitten by the snake so many times. Wu still wonders how they could affect 27 bodies at once. He thinks they must have mixed cursed poison in their food and are stimulating the poison through sound. He hears them call out for him and tries to think quickly. Wu decides not to run because he doesn't want them to find out about his resistance. He still doesn't want them to know he's different, so he lays on the ground and pretends to be in pain. They find Wu laying on the ground and call for the first sword. The first sword draws his blade and strikes down on Wu. The first sword wants to know what Wu was doing in his room. He also says Wu has done a great job hiding his true talents. The first sword pulls his blade out and says a nuisance like him is better off being killed right now. But the second sword begs him not to. He says they need Wool to complete their objective. The first sword responds angrily and says the other trainees are enough. They both know that isn't true though. The second sword says they can control Wool by using the flute since he is clearly powerless against the curse poison. The first sword likes that idea and tells the masked men to provide everyone with the antidote. After the antidote, everyone recovers but they don't understand what happened. The first sword announces that the pain they just went through was all because of Wool and this would have never happened if he didn't infiltrate their base. He warns them and says, if anyone ever steps out of line again, remember the pain they experienced today. Later on, we see Wool reflecting on the events that transpired. He recalls the real ones believing he was powerless against the poison. He is satisfied the snake venom subdued the cursed poison and allowed him to avoid the restriction. But once again, Wool hears footsteps down the hall. Min and the others are looking for Wool. Yeo can't believe Wool spends his time in a disgusting place like this training. Yeo thinks Wool has no choice but to seclude himself, especially after the real ones put all the blame on him. Yoke gets impatient and cries out for Wool. Wool appears out of nowhere and asks why they're looking for him. Wool has scared them all and he asks again. Yeo says they just wanted to talk. She wants to know about the restriction. Yeo knows that Wool knows about the restriction and says he wasn't there when everyone else collapsed. But when everyone regained their senses, he was there right beside them. And that means Wool appeared after the restriction was activated. Yeo was able to put together that the restriction had little to no effect on Wool. Then, Min remembers when she was in pain, she was able to endure it because someone infused internal energy into her. She wonders if that someone was Wool. Yeo pressures Wool again and asks if he knows. Wool finally admits that he does. He tells them that he knows exactly what kind of restriction they placed on them. Yeo demands that he tell them what it is. But Wool doesn't want to and asks why he should. Why should he go out of his way to help them? What is that benefit to him? Yolk gets angry and says this isn't how someone treats their comrades. Comrades? Wool asks. Comrades wouldn't chase after and attack each other with such hate, he says. Yolk sees Wool's perspective and swears from now on they can be comrades. No matter what happens, he will always consider him to be a friend. Everyone sees right through that, and Wolf says he's got to do more to earn his trust. Yoke applauds Wolf's attempt to silk masks and says Wolf would only benefit from having a friend like him. He invites him to the public floral performance troupe if they ever regain their freedom again. This way, Yoke will be able to help him at least a little. Yeo jumps in and says she'll also consider Wolf a friend if he helps. She also adds that everyone in her group will never show him hostility. Min, feeling left out, says she will never betray Wool. Feeling fed up with all these lies, Wool spits out that the restriction is curse poison. They ask for clarification. Wool says they were all poisoned by curse poison. It's a type of poisonous organism. It normally lays dormant in their bodies, but it releases poison in response to the sound waves of the hell flute. The poison flows through their blood vessels and attacks their internal organs. Yeo then asks how Wool could withstand the poison. Wool says he's normally resistant to poison, so it doesn't have a strong impact on him. He says he's told them everything they'd need to know and they can figure out how to remove the curse poison on their own. Wool doesn't want to give them the full truth as that could create countless variables. 
Yeo thanks him for the information and says he can come to her if he ever needs anything. Wool says he may take her up on that one day and they turn away. But Min catches Wool and tells him her real name is Lee Sol Min. Wool doesn't understand why he needs to know that, but she says she just wants him to remember it. Later on, the First Sword announces that they will be leaving the cave today. The trainees are happy to hear that, but they're still not sure if that's true. The First Sword calls for Yeo and tells her she's responsible for leading the others outside. She understands her mission and the basket descends from the ceiling. As the real ones leave, they wonder how many of their trainees will survive. They train them well, but their target is a martial artist with the highest level of talent in the Jenghu. The first sword is relieved though, as his job is now done and he can retire. The real ones make it outside and the trainees are ecstatic. This is the day they've waited so long for. Yeo takes charge and begins constructing their exit. Wool is relieved but still feels it's too good to be true. Yeo approaches Wool and asks him if he's ready for their mission. He says he is and asks about the curse poison. Yeo says they were detoxified because Min apparently knew a lot about poison. Most of the others have finally left and Yeo says it's their turn to go. The basket drops one last time and they get on. As the basket ascends, Wool looks down at the place he spent the last seven years in. They were so deep underground it may have actually been hell. They get close to the exit and Wool thinks to rip his arm sleeve off. They need to cover their eyes as they haven't seen daylight in years. The others realize they could be blinded and follow suit. The light gets stronger as the basket ascends but they finally make it out. Before they could even look out, a man approaches the basket. We seem to have made some useful ones, he says. Wool's eyes still haven't adjusted and the man says the requester will be satisfied. He can't see him, but Wolf thinks his voice sounds like it's void of emotions. He assumes this man is in an executive position from the way he talks. He must be the captain of the Blood Shadow Group, Wolf thinks. Wolf is correct, he is Gu Ju Yang, the Blood Shadow Group captain. Gu orders for them to be moved to the Clear Wind Manor. As they're being taken to the carriage, Wolf looks back at Gu. He's memorized his voice. They reach the manor and Gu tells the trainees that this is where they will be acclimated to the outside world. He warns them not to let their guard down or he will take care of the consequences himself. Wool was placed in a dorm with Go and Yoke. Wool tells his new roommates that he's going to wash up at the well. Wool bathes and is feeling refreshed. He lays in the grass and he takes in the beautiful nature. He spends the night out in the grass and wakes to a beautiful day. The others admire a flower they've never seen before. They can't believe they live to see something so beautiful once again. But as they're rejoicing, here comes the captain. Gu drops some weapons on the ground in front of the trainees. He says they'll now be distributed weapons and they need to keep them safe. They will be using them soon, he says. Later on in the palace, we see Gu and the First Sword having a meeting. Gu is thanking his uncle, the First Sword, for all his hard work. The First Sword says he was just doing his job. Gu says the Blood Shadow group is prosperous thanks to the First Sword's hard work and asks how he can repay him. But the first sword says there is no favor to repay. If it weren't for the previous head, he'd already be dead. Gu then grants his uncle the option to retire. And the option is also available for the second and third sword. These are the words the first sword has waited seven years to hear. He then admits to his nephew that the trainees are truly a waste. They are too talented to throw away after one use. Gu shares the same belief, but he says he has no choice. The relationship with the trainee has to end here. The First Sword asks Gu if he knows who requested the objective. Gu says he doesn't know, but there's no reason to question anyone willing to pay 500,000 yang for a request. Gu then envisions the Blood Shadow group becoming the greatest assassin group in the world. Completing this objective would put them ahead of the Hundred Wrath Union. After the meeting, we see Wool preparing for his mission with Yoke and a few other assassins. Yoke asks Wool if he's nervous, and Wool says he is a little. But they've spent so much time together now, to where Yoke can tell when Wool is lying. Wool accuses Yoke for being nervous because of how much he's talking. Like always, Yoke gets defensive. Yoke says he wants nothing more than getting revenge on someone for his last seven years of suffering. The group of assassins are now called to begin their mission. They are told they will now be stealthily moving somewhere. This is what Wool has been waiting for. They head out into the night and follow the fourth sword. The newly trained group is keeping up with the fourth sword and he's impressed. They've clearly been trained well. He also believes how much of a waste their talent would be after being disposed of. They reach their targeted location and the fourth sword instructs them to hide out here for now. 
The assassins all hide and the fourth sword tells them their objective lives within that mountain. He begins describing the mission and says, once they climb the mountain, they will see a manor that looks exactly like the one they were living in underground. Among the buildings, the man inside the Bright Moon Palace is their target. The assassins are anxious to get started as they have that building memorized. Wool is the only one in the group who knows their target is Wu Gun Sang. We're now brought to a woman staring off into the distance. Her name is Young. She's admiring some flowers and one stands out to her. She reaches out to touch it and the flower immediately evaporates. As Young processes what just happened, she hears someone calling for her. It's Sol Ran. Ran is the Emmy sec leader and she wants to know what Young was doing outside alone. Young responds that she was just trying to catch the nice breeze. Ran asks Young if she still resents her. Young says, not necessarily, but her life is on the line with this request and she would have liked to have been excused from it. Ran is disgruntled and doesn't appreciate Young's attitude. Ran tells Young she must have forgotten who brought her in when she was just a beggar on the streets. She says she better not want to be excused after everything she's done for her. Young apologizes and doesn't want Ran to be upset as it's bad for her health. Ran says if they don't receive an answer today, they will carry out their initial plan. Young agrees as she's always ready to follow her master. As the conversation ends, a messenger comes running with news. The messenger tells Ran that they have accepted the proposal. This is great news for the sect and Ran tells Young the fate of their sect now rides on her performance. Young assures Ran that she has nothing to worry about. Ran thinks to herself how disappointed she is that she has to waste a talent like Young as a political tool instead of her successor. The messenger asks Ran what they should do regarding the other matter. Ran asks if she's referring to the objective for 500,000 Yang. Only time will tell what Ran has in store for the Blood Shadow group. We now see Wool waking up and wondering if it's still morning. He knows the mission will be carried out at night so they still have some time left. He lays back down to rest but something doesn't feel right to him. Suddenly, a spear drops down and strikes one of the other assassins. Wool is in shock as him and the other assassins are under attack. The story continues and we see a monk named Yu spiking his spear into the ground. He's trying to figure out if something is there. Yu pulls his spear out out of the ground and his suspicions were correct. He's discovered that assassins are hiding around the mountain. Yu looks to his men and says, The Qin Chang sect is being invaded. He wants them to find all the assassins and eliminate them. Wall knows him and the others are at a disadvantage. They decide retreating is their best option to survive. The monks begin spearing random areas in the ground hoping to find an assassin using their special abilities. But one of the monks gets too close and the assassins jump to the sky. They plan to disperse and regroup once they get out of the encirclement. The monks aren't going to let them off easy though and chase after them. Yu ferociously throws his spear and lands one of the assassins. Yu calls for another spear and immediately claims another assassin. He takes another spear and gets another assassin. This is almost too easy for Yu. Wool's partners are dropping like flies and Wool is the only assassin left now. Yu takes his last throw and it's heading right for Wool. Wool catches the spear and fires it right back. The spear blows past the other monks and it's heading right for Yu. As the monks turn to watch the spear fly past them, Wool takes this as his opportunity to attack the group of monks closest to him. And the spear is heading to Yu so fast it just grazes his ear. This infuriates Yu and he wants them to hunt Wool down until he's lifeless. Wool is really outnumbered now without his partners and decides it will be best to run away. As Wool runs for his life, he tries to figure out how the monks knew they were hiding out. He believes someone may have leaked the information. But he's the only one who knew who their target was so it could have been the fourth sword or one of his subordinates. They retreated before they were ambushed. The monks catch up to Wool and hurt him with a spear. Wool goes down, but he fights to get back up. He didn't spend six years underground to lose his life like this. Wool wonders if there was conflict in the Blood Shadow group or if the requester just changed their mind. The only thing he knows for sure right now is that the Blood Shadow group has abandoned him. Wool reaches the end of the path and has to hide. However, he is leaving a blood trail. As one of the monks tries to analyze Wool's trail, Wool drops down from a tree and takes him out. He's forced to survive on his own with a group of monks chasing after him. With no other choice, Wool jumps into the river. He makes it out of the water and finds a message on one of the stones. The message is giving directions to a location 600 meters north. Wool follows the trail and sees another message with a shorter distance. Wool is now closing in on the location. With the amount of blood on these rocks, Wool believes whoever wrote this code is badly injured. 
but off into the distance, Wool hears people searching for him. Wool starts wondering if these messages may be a setup. He knows there has to be at least seven different clans participating by the amount of uniforms they are wearing. Suddenly, Wool feels danger and falls down to avoid a strike. As he lays flat, he looks up and sees Min. She didn't realize she was attacking Wool. She's happy to see him, but she is badly injured and collapses. Wool tries to catch her, but he can't. With how much she's bleeding, he doesn't think she's going to make it. He asks where the others are, and she says most of them are dead. Wool asks about Yeo and Song, but Min says she doesn't know what happened to them because they all dispersed. She recalls them taking charge and ordering their group to run while they fight. They were leaders until the very end. Wool gets emotional as his friends are losing their lives. Wool lays Min down and tells her she is going to pass away shortly. She knows, but she is happy she at least won't die alone. Wool asks her if she's scared to die, and he also asks her if she wants to live. Min says she wants to live and asks if Wool can save her. He says he can't, and Min says that's why she's giving up. She knows her body is in rough shape. Min is just glad she won't have to die alone. She asks Wool if he will stay with her to the end. Holding back his tears, he says he will. Min proceeds to say, after everything they went through to survive, it's hard to believe this is how it ends. She wants to know who did this to them and why anyone would do this. She hopes whoever did this to them feels the pain she feels right now. Wool tells Min it was because of Wu Gun Sang. Min asks for clarification on what Wool meant by that. Wool says their target was Wu Gun Sang of the Ching Chang sect. Someone requested the Blood Shadow group to terminate Wu Gun Sang. That's why they were kidnapped and raised as assassins. And now that they're useless, they're trying to erase them from the plan. Wool tells her if he can survive, he can find out who messed with their lives. He plans to find them and take revenge, even if it's the last thing he does. Min can barely understand as she senses the end coming. She tells Wool that she wants him to survive. For her dying wish, she wants Wool to say her name, her full name. He grants her wish and she thanks him. Min just wanted to hear Wool call her name before she left. As Min's spirit leaves her body, Wool promises to get revenge on whoever did this to them. Back at the palace, we see Gu reading a message. The fourth sword reports to Gu that the assassins will not be able to escape. As Gu reads the message, he says, Now it's truly a waste to throw the assassins away after all that time. The assassins won't even be able to be used because Gu has received a message saying their objective is now void. The fourth sword asks if that means that the palace is in danger and Gu says they won't be able to find this place. He thinks it will be best to wait there until the storm passes over. Then the fourth sword asks if Gu truly doesn't know who the requester is. Gu says he can find out but there is a line to be kept. Gu is not worried as they were kind enough to send them a message. But then the fourth sword sees the message and he freaks out. The message was infused with tracking incense. And suddenly one of the real ones is dropped. The palace is now under attack. The first sword tries to warn the attackers and tells them to retreat as they are no match. But they refuse to back down. The fourth sword tells Gu that they must retreat. But Gu says he can't go anywhere. They are here for him and they won't let him escape. Gu says they crossed the line and he prepares to fight back. Gu rushes them and says they will be devoured if they bite. Gu calls for all forces to hold on a little more. But off into the distance, Gu hears someone say no. You won't have that opportunity. An attack is directed towards Gu, but he's able to defend. He felt so much power and asked who that person was. The woman is offended that a measly assassin wouldn't know her name. As she gets closer, Gu recognizes her as the life-ending toxic heart Zhang Gua. As Gu is about to ask if she was the requester, she stops him and says that she will pull his tongue if he says any more. Gu puts it together and realizes the requester was from the Emmy sect. He now regrets not investigating who the requester was. This choice has brought forth a disaster, but he refuses to die. Zhang Gua is annoyed by Gu's hope and sends another attack. Gu is again able to defend and fights back. Zhang Gua is impressed with Gu's level of martial art. She's glad they're fighting in daylight so Gu wouldn't be able to set up an ambush using the darkness of the night. She knows she has to finish him and everyone else in the Blood Shadow group. Zhang Gua sends one final blast on Gu and he can't defend that one. He knows he's going to die and fears this is the end of the Blood Shadow group. He reflects on the hard work he put into this group to rival the Hundred Wrath Union. 
and this inspires him to keep fighting. He attacks Jung-Hwa again, but then suddenly, a third party joins in. He knows he's in trouble, and he can no longer withstand the attack. Down goes Gu, and the assassins cry out for their captain before getting speared. Zhang Hua turns to her master, Ran, and greets her. Ran can't believe they had such a hard time finishing these measly assassins. Zhang Hua apologizes and says, they fought back harder than expected. Gu cries out for Ran and asks how she could do this to him after requesting his group. Gu continues to cry and accuses Ran of betrayal. But Ran has heard enough and quickly puts an end to Gu. Ran acts confused like she had no idea what Gu was talking about and orders for her group to finish the rest. Next to go down is the first sword. He drops to the ground, yelling Emisect. The first sword knows ever since Ran became the leader, they've been raising their forces at an alarming rate. He asks for the name of the woman who just cut through him. She tells him her name is Young. He says he heard that one of Ran's disciples possessed unfathomable talent and it must be her. Young says those are exaggerated rumors. The first sword takes his last breath and thinks it's ironic that being an assassin for decades was no match for a disciple of the Emmy sect. Young goes to report to her sister that the first sword has been eliminated. Now we see the fourth sword being brought to Ran. Ran asks him how many assassins he took to the mountain. He doesn't answer and asks why she wants to know. She demands he answer, but he says he doesn't know. The fourth sword says even if he knew, he couldn't tell her, especially not after everything she's done to his palace. Ran thinks his tenacity is cute and tortures him. She asks her question again, and the fourth sword says he took 28 assassins. Ran got what she needed and asks how many assassins have been eliminated from the mountain. The woman says 24 have been taken out. Ran wants the four left eliminated immediately. As the palace is in flames, Ran turns to Young and says, her role is now more crucial than ever. Ran says she will send someone to the Ching Chang sect to set a date as soon as this matter is dealt with. She also tells Young to prepare her heart and body for the wedding. Ran tells Young all of this is for the fate of the sect. Meanwhile, back on the mountain, we see Wool spying on the monks. Their security is tight at the entrance, so he plans to get through from the inside. He thinks if they want to die as natural enemies of the Jang Hu, he'll just become one. A natural enemy of the Jang Hu. Inside their base, we see a monk preparing to leave to collect herbs. His friends tell him to be careful because things have been restless recently. As the monk wanders the forest alone, he is attacked and put into a headlock by Wool. He tries to ask Wool who he is, but Wool draws his sword on him. Wool wounds him, and in pain, the monk wonders who would do such a thing on this mountain. Wool asks the monk if he is a disciple of the Ching Chang sect. The disciple nods and Wool lets him down so he can ask him some more questions. Wool asks for the disciple's name and he says his name is Do. He is a third generation disciple of the Ching Chang sect. Wool asks Do what kind of man Wu Gun Sang is. Do panics and asks if he's talking about senior brother Wu Gun Sang, the Lone Star of Ching Chang. Wu wants to know what Do meant by calling him the Lone Star of Ching Chang. Do says, Senior brother, Wu Gun Sang is the greatest prospect that the Ching Chang sect has ever birthed. He mastered most of the Ching Chang sect's martial arts and has reached a very high stage. Do has heard that former masters of the Ching Chang sect have shown interest in him and are giving him their teachings. The Ching Chang sect's prospect, Wu thinks to himself. Now he understands why they spent all that time training. Do asks Wool to spare his life since he's told him everything he knows. But when he turns around to look at Wool, he gasps. Wool is transforming and Do is scared for his life. He has no idea what Wool is doing and when he looks back at Wool again, he sees himself. Do is confused and tries to think of what Wool is plotting. Back at the monk's base, the guards up front are surprised to see Do has returned so quickly. Do says he's back because he forgot something. Do walks through the entrance and it almost seems like a new world to him. And that's because it is. Wool has morphed himself into the Disciple Do. Wool makes his way through the base and searches for Wu Gun Sang's residence. Wool was able to quickly find where Wu Gun Sang lives. In the Ching Chang sect's palace, we see a meeting being held. The Ching Chang sect leader is asking if the situation outside has calmed down. His second-in-command, Jin, says the tracking of the assassins seems to be nearing its end. The sect leader is still appalled that mere assassins dared to attack their sect. Jin says someone must have plotted this. 
The sect leader asks if he knows who could have plotted this, but Jin says they lack information, but he sent some disciples to gather information. Then, the sect's greatest warrior chimes in and says, this act is unforgivable. He wants to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. Jin assures him not to worry. Then, the sect leader reminds everyone of the war of heaven and demons. In the moment of danger, when the Jenghu was about to be overrun by the Celestial Demon Union, the extraordinary martial artist, Li Guac, formed the Providence Alliance. And those who opened their doors to participate, the Shaolin Temple, the Wudain Sect, and the Mount Hua Sect accomplished great feats and regained their former glory. And those who sealed their doors and did not participate, such as the Qingqing Sect and the Emi Sect, only earned the empty name of Great Family of Sichuan and cannot hold a candle to them in actuality. The sect leader says if they desire to catch up to the others, they cannot hold back and must stay focused. Once again, Jin warns everyone not to worry. He says if things go according to plan, they will be caught up within a few years. The sect's greatest warrior likes the sound of that and asks how Jin's son, Wu Gunsang, is doing. He knows he hasn't shown himself to the outside world at all. As far as they know, he has isolated himself to focus on his training with a thought of atonement. Jin apologizes for not being able to raise his own son properly. The sect's greatest warrior says, it's alright, it's understandable for a boy his age, and there's no need to apologize for something that has already been taken care of peacefully. Jin says he will make sure that he pulls himself together. The sect's greatest warrior says, whatever society says, there's no denying that Wu Gunsang possesses true talent. He also says if he's raised right, he won't fall behind the successors of the three great sects. Then the sect leader intervenes and says, he heard Jin has accepted the Emi sect's proposal of marriage for Wu Gun Sang. Jin says that it's true. The sect leader says marriage with the Emi sect is not bad and asks if the bride is the disciple of Ran. Jin says that she is her youngest disciple. He also says there are rumors that she possesses both beauty and intelligence. Not a bad match for Wu Gun Sang, but he still has some concerns because of Ran. Ran is desperate to catch up to the Ching Chang set. If Gun Sang marries her youngest disciple, they may be the ones to be devoured. That's why Jin has rejected the proposal until now. But the sect's greatest warrior comforts him and says they have no choice. They can't continue to be enemies with the Emi sect in such a small territory. Since Wu Gun Sang is the only hope of the Ching Chang sect given very special care. Meanwhile, Wu is still outside Wu Gun Sang's residence. It's his first time seeing the real thing, but the layout is exactly the same as the one from the underground cave. The front gate is locked, but Wu knows exactly how to break in. Wu hops on the roof, but he hears two guys approaching and lays down. These two monks are upset Wu Gun Sang is using isolation training as an excuse to be alone with women. One of the monks wonders if one of their disciples is with Wu Gun Sang while the other is trying to keep him quiet. Wu is shocked to hear that Wu Gun Sang brings women into the sect. It's unimaginable to be with a woman in the sword training hall. The two men leave and Wu takes a second to gather his thoughts. There's bound to be someone who's different on the inside wherever you go, he thinks. The night time comes and Wu is ready to make his next move. He runs along the building and breaks his way in. He can't find Wu Gun Sang anywhere though. Wu decides to crawl through the vents hoping he will find a way to Wu. In another room, we see swords laying around, and under the vent in that room is a man laying with a woman. Wu looks through the vent and sees the man. It's Wu Gun Sang. From the vent, Wu can tell that he is on a whole other level compared to Gu, the Blood Shadow group captain. But he is still human, so Wu thinks if he struck on the death pressure point, he will die. Wu begins lowering a rope from the vent. Wu carefully tries to place the rope around Wu, but once the rope is wrapped around Wu, he wakes up. Wu knows he has to hurry and yanks the rope. As Wu is carried up, he uses his hand to slice the rope. Wu is free from the rope and now comes face to face with Wu. He asks Wu who he is. Wu answers by drawing his blades. Wu rushes at Wu, but Wu is unfazed. He puts two fingers up and blocks Wu's attack. Wu is taken back by his strength and Wu fights back. And Wu doesn't stop there. He initiates another attack. Using all his strength, Wu defends. Wu feels like he may lose consciousness from all the energy he's using blocking. He doesn't understand how someone could do all this barehanded. Wu knows he's running out of time to get out of this situation. It will only get worse. Wu tries another attack with his blade and is blocked yet again by Wu's two fingers. Wu takes the time to acknowledge Wu's skills. 
Wu asks Wu who sent him, but Wu is out of breath and can't respond. Wu laughs and asks if that girl's father sent him. Wu is clueless. The story continues and we get a brief summary of Wu Gansang's life. Learning martial arts was always easy for Wu, but though he was extremely talented, he wasn't having fun. Wu became disinterested in training and became interested in women, but one night he met a woman who became his biggest mistake. After his drunken encounter with this woman, she took her own life. And as punishment, Wu was forced to spend a whole year training in isolation. Now, Wu is face to face with Wu, who has spent most of his life training to kill him. But Wu thinks Wu was sent by that girl's father to avenge her death. Wu has no idea what Wu is talking about and can only focus on how overwhelming he is. Every ounce of energy seeping out of Wu is intense and terrifying. It almost seems as if he's made of thousands of blades. Wu rushes Wu and attacks. Wu is using a ton of energy just blocking Wu's attacks. Wu is able to sneak in a kick and his tricks are really annoying Wu. Wu counters Wu and sends him to the ground hoping to deal the final blow. Wu is able to dodge the attack and he runs for a blade. Wu fires the blade at Wu but it's blocked. Everything Wu does is blocked but he has no choice but to keep attacking. Wu's attacks are blocked yet again and Wu reveals the Ching Chang secret technique 72 sword waves. Wu knows he's in trouble so as Wu is rushing towards him, Wu grabs the woman Wu was with to shield him. Wu is annoyed yet again so he attempts to strike Wu with his sword. As he's being attacked, Wu remembers telling Yeo that only time would tell if he was a scapegoat or a wolf. Wu uses this as motivation to fight back. Wu is surprised Wu is able to defend the secret martial art technique of the Ching Chang sect. Wu learned it to death in order to survive. He's confident in demolishing it. Wu uses the swift mind technique to maneuver around Wu. Wu sees a window and takes his chance. Wu sends his sword right through Wu's chest. Wu can't believe it. Wu has completed the objective and avenged the Blood Shadow group. There's panic and unrest in the sect. The bells toll and inside Wu Gunsang's residence, we see Jin devastated. He doesn't understand how something like this could happen. Then, the sect's greatest warrior realizes something. He tells the sect leader that they need to dispose of that girl. The sect leader questions how he could suggest disposing of a disciple of the sect. The sect's greatest warrior says, Wu Gunsang's reputation is on the line. If word got out that he was with a girl during isolation training, his reputation would hit rock bottom, as well as theirs. This idea is upsetting to the sect leader. The sect's greatest warrior sees that and says, what's done is done. He says, since Wu Gunsang is dead, our sect's reputation will collapse if nothing is done. He thinks there must have been someone who hired the assassin. Someone that would benefit from the fall of Wu Gunsang and the Ching Chang sect. The sect's greatest warrior says, they must not let that happen, no matter what. But as the sect leader thinks how to respond, they are interrupted by their brothers. They say they cannot. No matter how important the sex reputation is, it's not as important as a human life. The sex greatest warrior says, at this rate, forget catching up to the Shaolin or the Wu Dang. Our gap will only widen and we will be reduced to some mere sect. And as they ponder over that statement, Jin gets up with his son's sword. He begins walking and approaches the disciple. He says, as a disciple of our sect, I'm sure you understand. The disciple cries and Jin says, you should have helped him. The disciple begs Jin to spare her life, but it's too late. The sect leader runs to Jin and asks, What have you done? Jin says he had no choice. Wu wasn't just the hope of the Ching Chang sect, he was his everything. He can't just stand by and watch as his reputation crumbles. Jin says he will accept any punishment for his actions. Now at the Emmy sect, Ran receives a message. She cannot believe that an assassin actually killed Wu Gun Sang. She is furious that all the assassins weren't captured. Her plan to rule the Ching Chang sect has been ruined by her backup plan that was no longer necessary. Zhang Guo says they need to find and eliminate the assassin responsible because they might know the secret. Ran says the Ching Chang sect has already asked for their help. She asks Zhang Guo to gather the others. She wants them to set up the inescapable net immediately. Ran turns to Young and says she must be overjoyed now that the wedding is cancelled. Young says, of course she's not happy. She just lost her husband. Ran's not sure if she's being mocked, but the disciples exit. Out in a rural area, we see a farmer strolling down the road. The farmer asks what's going on, and the two men say they're looking for a criminal who has committed a grave sin. They demand the farmer identify himself, and he says his name is Cheo. He lives in a nearby village, and he's heading home after today's farming. 
They ask how he could be done so early, and Cheo says he finished cutting weeds early. They decide to let Cheo pass, but as he walks by, one of the men notices something off. He stops Cheo and asks how he could be so clean after farming. If you cut weeds, there must be some sort of trace, especially on the sickle. The farmer gets nervous, and the men accuse him of being the assassin that Ran said killed Wu Gun Sang. They fire off a signal and call for backup. The man's suspicions were correct, it's Wool. He orders his men to capture him. Wool reveals his true identity and fights back. Wool stares the man down and reveals his new weapon. He begins choking the man and asks, Who is this Ran you speak of? The man says, Ran is the abbess of Nine Calamities, the leader of the Emmy sect. Wool asks if she gave the man a direct order. The man says she ordered all disciples of the Emmy sect to help the Chin Chang sect capture the assassin no matter what. Wool asks if the Emmy sect was always that helpful towards the Chin Chang sect. The man says no and thinks to himself his backup should be here any second. Wool tries to put the pieces together. It has to be someone who knows Wu Gun Sang and is inferior to him. Someone who has the patience to invest seven years worth of time as well as possess enough wealth to pour a huge amount of money into the plan. Wool concludes it has to be Ran. Backup arrives and they rush towards Wool. The man thinks he's about to be saved and tells Wool he's done. He threatens Wool again and Wool has had enough. Wool finishes them all. Back at the Emmy sect, it's reported that the assassin has broken through the martial artist's encircling net and has escaped. This gives Zhang Hua a headache as this means the assassin is getting stronger. She says they will pursue him with all their forces. But then, Young intervenes and says no. She says they won't be able to capture him that way. Zhang Hua asks Young what she means by that. Young says the fact that he hasn't been caught with an inescapable net means that he possesses skills greater than they expect. If we continue to chase him like this, we will only be seeing the back of his head. Zhang Hua asks Young for a better idea, and Young says they need to predict where he will go next. She has an idea of where he might be headed. The assassin has to be exhausted, so it's likely that he will return to the place he feels safest. That is probably the place where he was raised as an assassin for a very long time. She says they've found that the location where the Blood Shadow group raised the assassins is somewhere around Batang. Zhang Hua is annoyed with how smart Young is, but confirms that the area was being provided with many supplies. Zhang Hua says they will head to Batang and try to beat him there. They were quick to locate Wool and are chasing him down. They know he's injured, so they believe he won't last long. Wool runs up the wall and thinks he can lose them. He doesn't understand how they can predict where he's going. When Wool looks back at them, he locks eyes with Young the mastermind behind this plan. As Wool continues running, he realizes things have gone quiet. He wonders if they've given up, but as he looks back, he sees a large burst heading right towards him, and there's a large explosion. As the dust settles, we see the Ching Cheng sect's greatest warrior. The warrior realizes his attack was vicious and careless. He needs to capture Wool alive so they can find out who ordered the assassination. He commands his disciples to see if Wool is still alive, and watching from above is Zhang Hua. She spots Wool and rushes to attack. The Chin Chang sect's greatest warrior notices that Zhang Hua is attacking with the intent to kill. On their search, they find an entrance that leads underground. They believe this is where Wool went. The Chin Chang sect's greatest warrior orders his disciples to climb the rope down. The assassin must be captured alive, he says. After watching the Chin Chang sect, Zhang Hua orders her disciples to do the same. But she wants the assassin dead. Both sects make their way down, and they are shocked to see this is where the Blood Shadow group raised their assassins. Then, the Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior makes another shocking discovery. He sees an exact replica of the Ching Chang sect. Zhang Hua notices the building too and gets nervous. A Ching Chang sect disciple also notices and gets angry. He tells his master they must not let this slide. The Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior knows this means Wu Gun Sang's assassination has been planned for a long time and it's impossible to maintain such a facility without someone's assistance. He believes there had to have been someone protecting them. Zhang Hua watches and is speechless. The warrior begins laughing and tells his disciples that capturing the assassin is their main priority right now. He reiterates that he must be captured alive. The disciples understand his terms and begin their journey. Zhang Hua approaches the warrior and says she will command her disciples to do the same. The warrior also tells her to capture him alive. He says, you can do whatever you want to him, but he must be captured alive. Zhang Hua nervously accepts his request. As she walks away, he says, if the assassin loses his life, he will be very upset. 
Someone has clearly looked down on our sect. He plans to hunt them down, even if the perpetrators are one of the five great sects. Zhang Hua says he has nothing to worry about. The two aren't even facing each other, and Zhang Hua is nervous. She knows that he is suspicious of the Emmy sect. She walks away sweating and knows she has to find the assassin before the Ching Chang sect does, no matter what. Young explores the cave, and she sensed danger as soon as they entered. Everyone wants to capture the assassin, but this is his home, she thinks. She knows both sects are out of their element down here. The Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior finds the real one space. He looks around and notices how massive this facility is. As he walks through the base of the real ones, he doubts assassins made this by themselves. He can't piece together who could have helped them build something like this. He finally reaches the last room in the base. The warrior walks in and immediately starts looking for clues. He brushes his hand against the wall and finds a secret pressure plate. This unveils a hole in the wall and inside the wall is a golden tube. He opens the tube and reads the message inside. He's found the request to assassinate Wu Gun Sang. Enraged, he can't believe someone destroyed the Ching Chang sect's future for a measly 500,000 yang. Then, off to the side, he notices an even larger hole in the wall. He walks in and sees a book sitting on a table, but this isn't an ordinary room. This is a pit with thousands of snakes. He walks towards the table and looks at the book. It's a book from the Nine Demon School. He grabs the book and believes the Nine Demon School is the clan that disappeared a very long time ago during the War of Heaven and Demons. As he thinks about the situation, the search for Wu continues. The Ching Cheng sect disciples find grains of rice on the floor and they think he's nearby. They tell each other not to let their guards down as you never know when the assassin will attack. They walk away together but one of the disciples falls behind. He should have stayed closer to the group because sure enough, Wu attacks. The other disciples don't notice because they still can't believe the assassin lived underground. One of the disciples believes the assassin must have cheated in his battle with Wu Gun Sang. He thinks there's no way Wu could have lost an honest battle. And Wu didn't appreciate that, so he takes care of him. Now, the others notice their fallen friends and begin to scatter, giving Wu the advantage to take them out one by one. One disciple remains, and though he is afraid, he dares the assassin to show his face. Wu has a little fun with him and turns the torches off. The other group of disciples is having no luck. The Ching Chang sect disciple Ming thinks if running away was his sole purpose, he would have done whatever it took to outrun his pursuers and hide. But instead, he's lured his enemies into the domain he knows best. He believes Wu is trying to fight until the end in the environment he's most familiar with. Ming wants to be the one to capture the assassin as it would catapult his reputation in the sect. He begins giving orders to the other disciples and wants them to follow him in pairs. And above everything else, he wants them to keep their guards up. But with his next step, Ming steps on a pressure plate. He yells for everyone to watch out as a fury of arrows fire at them. Ming didn't expect to walk into a trap and some of the disciples are injured. He looks up and sees another round coming. Ming warns everyone again and can't believe anyone could live in a cave with traps like this. The story continues and we see the Ching Cheng sect's greatest warrior looking at the thousands of snakes in the pit. He believes the snakes have been collected for research by the Nine Demon School. The warrior wonders if this cave was originally the base of the Nine Demon School. Meanwhile, the Emisec disciples are panicking. They are afraid Wu will attack at any moment. Zhang Hua then displays her leadership by trying to calm the disciples down. Zhang Hua yells for them to stop panicking. She says the assassin won't make any rash movements since he's injured. The most important thing is to not scatter, but gather. Wu knows he's racing against time due to his injuries, so he decides to make a move. But Zhang Hua senses something is wrong. As Wu is inches away, she turns quickly to defend. She is going head to head with Wu. Zhang Hua gets a hold of Wu's hand, so he tries to attack with the other. With his other hand, he aims for Zhang Hua's eye and sends two fingers through. She shrieks in pain, but that's all Wu was able to do. Wu was caught off guard by Young and now has her sword running through his side. Wu can tell Young has some great senses because of the perfect placement with her attack. Young is used to people complimenting her. Young then asks Wu to surrender, but Wu laughs and has something else in mind. He tries to attack Young, but she saw it coming. Wu gets up and pulls the sword out of his side. He looks back at Young and asks if she will spare him if he surrenders. Young hesitates and Wu says he knows she won't. He says she wouldn't have killed the rest of the Blood Shadow group if that were the case. Young then asks Wu how much he knows. He says he knows that Ran, the Abyss of Nine Calamities, is connected to everything. 
Not wanting any information being leaked, Zhang Wao demands Young kill Wu now. Young takes a second and says, although she is not fond of her master either, she has to avenge her fiancé, Wu Gun Sang. Wu knows facing Young head on is suicide. But before he tries to fall back, he's blasted with a ball of energy. Zhang Wan knows this is very bad for the Emmy sect, so she tries to finish him herself. But the greatest warrior is not going to allow it and tells her to get out the way. Zhang Wan tries to save the Emmy sect one more time and says, the assassin must be killed before he pulls any sorcery. The greatest warrior said he's not worried about that. He crouches down to talk to Wool and asks why he did it. Even an assassin should have the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, he says. Wool reveals to the greatest warrior that he was kidnapped and brought to the cave when he was 14. He didn't have the luxury of distinguishing between right and wrong. Wool says as someone who was raised to be an assassin, he didn't have a choice. The greatest warrior notices Wool isn't displaying any empathy. Wool's eyes are filled with such malice, and the greatest warrior feels he could have been a magnificent asset if he was raised right. The greatest warrior pulls out the tube and shows Wool he's found the request to kill Wu Gun Sang. The greatest warrior asks Wool who the requester is. Wool says he has an idea. He then asks the greatest warrior, didn't you stop them from killing me because you're also thinking of the same person? The greatest warrior looks back and Zhang Hua is sick to her stomach. The Ching Cheng sect disciples come running and ask if their master needs help. The greatest warrior asks Ming what happened to the others. Ming says they didn't make it because they fell into the assassin's trap. Upset, the warrior knows what he has to do next. He gets up and says to Wu, a quick death is too extravagant for you. He grabs Wu by the foot and begins dragging him. He wants Wu to die while feeling pain greater than hell. It's the least bit of atonement he can give to those he's killed. Atonement, Wu thinks to himself. He wants to know who will compensate him for the seven years he's lost. The greatest warrior has brought Wu all the way to the base of the real ones. With Wu's foot in hand, he stares down at the pit of snakes. The greatest warrior gives Wu one last chance and asks if he still has no intention to atone. All Wu can do is laugh. Now, the greatest warrior knows what he must do. He tells Wu he has no right to live in this world, and then he throws Wu down into the pit of snakes. He wants Wu to die a painful death while atoning for his sins. The greatest warrior turns to the others and says they will now exit the cave. He wants the entrance sealed so that no one may ever use this place ever again. Wu was left to die alone in the snake pit. The snakes waste no time and begin biting Wu. But as the starved snakes take their turn, Wu is not phased. Wu begins hissing back at the snakes and grabs a hold of one. Wu shows the snakes who's in charge and bites off one of the snakes' heads. Time passes and Wu spends years in the cave alone. Wu was able to make it out of the snake pit and learn the martial art techniques of the Ching Chang sect and the Emmy sect from the books left on the dead bodies. Wu has spent so much time underground with the snakes, he adopted many of their characteristics. Wu is completely transformed with lighter skin and hair. His body went through many changes with his new snake-only diet. Wu now awaits his opportunity to avenge himself. Above ground and Batang were brought to a brothel where we see a man being thrown out of the top floor. He was thrown out by Wool, who has made it out of the cave. Wool is asking to be left alone for three days, and this is clearly upsetting the boss. She doesn't understand who this man is or where he came from. One of her guards tries threatening Wool for throwing a martial artist from the Sapphire House in Batang out of the window. But Wool does not care and attacks both of the guards with his soul-reaping thread. The woman is intimidated as Wu has just subdued the guards with a flick of the wrist. She doesn't recall there being such a master in Sichuan. She now sees Wu is no ordinary man. The boss asks for Wu's forgiveness and says he can stay as long as he wants. She will provide Wu with whatever he needs and begs him to release her guards. Wu takes a second to think, but all the boss can think about is how serene his eyes are. To her, it feels like she's facing an enormous snake from the rainforest. Wu says he just needs three days. He releases the guards and says he would really appreciate it if no one disturbed him. The boss agrees to Wu's terms and asks for his name. He tells the boss his name is Wu. The three days pass and Wu is prepared to exit the brothel. When he left the cave, he didn't have any clothes, so the boss at the brothel was kind enough to lend him some. They not only provided him with a set of clothes, but they also gave him a box of lunch for when he gets hungry. As Wool leaves, the boss is still in disbelief as to who she just met. On Wool's journey, he takes a break to enjoy his meal and hide out from the rain. He's admiring nature as it's one thing he's missed for most of his life. 
Wool reflects on how seven whole years have passed. His past is not something he will ever forget, but he realizes if he doesn't break free from the past, he probably won't be able to move forward. And in order to break free from his past, the Ching Cheng sect and the Emmy sect have to pay for ruining his life. Wool thinks he'll be able to obtain more information about the sects if he heads to Chengdu. As Wool was on his break, we see a group of people approaching. They are also trying to find refuge from the rain. Once they get under the roof, they begin bickering about being wet. And after blaming each other, they spot Wool sitting there watching them. They are surprised to see someone else up in the mountains. The woman immediately compliments Wool on how handsome he is. Then, the man she's with says she should be thanking him for getting them lost. But this annoys her, so she tells him to shut up. She turns back to Wool and says it must be fate that they all ended up staying under the same roof together. She introduces herself as Rainju, and Wool introduces himself as well. Rainju is enamored and annoys her counterpart as she always goes crazy whenever she meets a handsome man. The man introduces himself as Daioshi, and the monk introduces himself as Hayu. Ranju asks Wool where he's headed, and he says he's going to Chengdu. Coincidentally, Ranju and the others are also headed to Chengdu. She thinks it'd be a great idea if they traveled together, but Wool is unsure. They're a peculiar combination of people at first sight, but they're all masters that can team up at any time. He wonders if Ranju is their central figure because it doesn't really seem like she's the leader. Wool is willing to take the chance and accepts. He believes there must be some other powerful order that keeps them together, and he wants to know more. They begin their trip together and find a crew to board with. Daioshi says they will leave in one hour. Ranju has to complain about something and says rice cargo ships are uncomfortable. She loves to make Daioshi's blood boil. Ranju then turns to Wool and asks why he's headed to Chengdu. Wool says he's meeting with an acquaintance. Ranju wants to know more, and Wool says he's meeting with people who owe him a debt. She asks if Wool is in debt, and he says no, he is owed a debt. Wool then asks why she's headed to Chengdu. Ranju says she's headed to Chengdu to do business. Wool says he doesn't see any merchandise with her. Ranju laughs and says, you can sell what you can't see. Daioshi then interrupts and asks Wool what clan he is from. Wool says he isn't part of a clan. They are surprised to hear that, and Wool asks if that's a problem. Daioshi says no, but is then left wondering who Wool is. As they're on the water, everything seems normal and peaceful. People are conversing and enjoying the company of others. Wool takes it all in after being isolated for so long. But his peace is disrupted when Ranju wants his attention. She wants to know what Wool is staring at. She says he had such a sentimental look on his face. Wool tells her to go away if she's going to keep talking nonsense. Ranju laughs it off and tells Wool he's playing with her heart like a fiddle. Daioshi and Hayu watch, and Hayu asks if they should intervene. Daioshi says the Almighty Blood Spider is not going to be bewitched by a man. All her actions are calculated. She sure is playing cuter for a woman with a temperament as malicious as a spider. Aside from that, Daioshi says Wool is quite suspicious. Then, the current gets stronger and disrupts their voyage. They look out and see an oncoming boat. It's a boat filled with pirates looking to steal their rice. One of the sailors yells for everyone to arm themselves. They are in quite the predicament, but then Daioshi asks the sailor if he needs help. The sailor asks Daioshi who he is, and Daioshi says it doesn't matter who he is, it only matters what he can do. Then, the monk, Hayu, jumps off the boat and lands on the pirate's boat. The pirates are a little thrown off at first, but they rush to attack. Hayu takes them on all by himself, leaving the sailors and his mates shocked. This is nothing Daioshi hasn't seen before. He tells the sailor the fee is 500 yangs. Hayu finishes all the pirates and hops back onto the cargo ship. Daioshi thanks him for his work, and Hayu says to have Ranju do it next time. Daioshi laughs it off and says he'd be relieved if she didn't go crazy on him just for asking. They look around to see where she is, and she is still trying to get Wool's attention. Ranju asks Wool to stay with them in Chengdu, but Wool says he's more comfortable alone. As Daioshi and Hayu receive their pay, they can't believe Ranju is still trying. But then, Daioshi concludes there's no way Wool is average. A normal person would be scared in this situation. He believes only someone who has gone through pandemonium can have such eyes. Ranju tries one last time and gives Wool her puppy eyes. Wool doesn't know what she's doing and Ranju says she can't believe he's turning her down. Wool says he's not into poisonous roses no matter how beautiful they are. Her tears quickly stop because she's glad Wool called her beautiful. That's enough for me, she says. 
Wolf thinks these people are vagabonds who sell their strength for money. Just now, they showed just enough strength for rumors of their skills to be spread throughout Chengdu. He wonders if that means a conflict large enough to require vagabonds has occurred in Chengdu. He doesn't believe that the Emi sect and the Qincheng sect would allow any sort of conflict to occur in the Chengdu. But then he thinks, what if their circumstances aren't very good? He remembers his last moments with the Qincheng sect and the Emi sect. Wu wants to force them to atone the way he was forced to. They finally dock the boat and are ready to head to Chengdu. Daoshi says they have to reach Chengdu by morning and asks Wu what his plan is. Wu says he will just stay here for the night. Ranju is upset and asks Wu if he's sure he can't go with them. Wu says he has something he has to prepare by himself. He provides her with a bit of hope and says he'll contact them when he reaches Chengdu. Ranju makes Wu promise and he does. They can finally head off and leave Wool. Wool makes his way into the town and enters a lodge. Immediately upon entering, Wool receives some looks. He's greeted and asked if he's there for a meal or a lodging. Wool says he is there for both and wants his meal first. Wool's meal is brought to him while a group of men question his clothing from afar. As Wool tries to enjoy his meal, he is interrupted by a man. This man introduces himself as Jang, the chief escort of the Nine Treasures Escort Corps. Jang then asks Wool why he's wearing women's clothing if he's a man. Jang says he made a bet with his comrades that he would find out. Wool says it's a shame that you just lost your money. Jang doesn't back down and says he can't tell if Wool is telling the truth. Jang's comrades dare him to strip Wool so everyone can know for sure. As Jang falls for the peer pressure, Wool flicks his chopstick right into Jang's eye. Jang's comrades get nervous as Jang is in tears. Jang can't believe he just got stabbed in the eye because of a joke. But this was a result of peer pressure. Wool decides since Jang can't see what's in front of him anyways, he'll just take his other eye as well. Jang's comrades finally try to back him up, but Wool loads up with more chopsticks. Wool fires off the chopsticks and takes out the bullies. He says they needed to take responsibility for their actions. Later on in the village of Chengdu, we see Ranju and the others. They notice that half the people roaming the streets are carrying a weapon. Ranju says this is the perfect opportunity for them. Hayu says one's misfortune is fortune for them. What could be more tragic than this, he asks. This annoys Ranju and she says she doesn't want to hear that kind of talk from him. Why not, Hayu asks. Ranju replies and asks, who do you think among us is the most money crazed? Daioshi, he quickly responds. Daioshi tells them to stop with their nonsense. They reach their destination and Ranju is happy to see her captain, Mer Yang. Mer Yang calls Ranju his vice captain and says she's right on time. Hayu and Daioshi also greet the captain as they haven't seen him in quite some time. Mer Yang greets them back. The four of them sit at a table and Daioshi says he was just in need of money after taking too long of a break. Mer Yang asks, isn't that why we've all come together? Daioshi says he must ask, are we really going to meddle in this matter? Mer Yang asks why. Is it burdensome? Then get out, he says. Daioshi nervously laughs and says, don't say that. Who said anything about that, he asks. Ranju then asks if it's because of the Qin Cheng sect and the Emi sect. Daioshi then asks, doesn't everyone know they've been in conflict with each other for seven years? That's right, Mer Yang answers. Mer Yang says, no one knows the reason, but they've had many disputes for the past several years, ranging from clashes between martial artists to an all-out battle. The conflict between the two greatest sects of the Sichuan naturally led to a split in all of Jang Hu and Sichuan. Mer Yang believes they will have a massive clash soon. Then, Ranju intervenes and says she wonders why they are fighting. Vice Captain Mer Yang says, that reason isn't important. What's important is that an opportunity for me to fulfill my dream has come true. Later on, we see Wool leaving the lodge. The owner of the lodge remembers Wool's actions and gets afraid. He hopes Wool will leave peacefully. Wool approaches the owner and asks, who here knows best about the internal affairs of Sichuan? The owner asks for clarification on what Wool means by internal affairs. Wool says he wants to know the situation between the sex. The owner says Wool should visit the workshop for that information, more specifically the Fire Dragon Room. It is a sect created through the gathering of Sichuan's artisans long ago. Since they've been doing business with all the sects of Sichuan for a long time, they'll gladly answer your questions if you buy a weapon from them first. Wool makes his way to the workshop. 
He sees a man yelling and asking his worker what he thinks he's doing. Who said you could use a hammer, the man asks. He yells, I told you not to ever use a hammer in the workshop, and he kicks his worker in the back of the head. Just do the chores you've been assigned, he says. His worker turns to him, but then the man asks the worker what he's looking at. He demands his worker to go to the back and do chores until he calls him back. He's forbidden from entering for the time being. Then, the man realizes Wool saw that whole interaction. He asks Wool what he has come to purchase. But Wool wants to know what that worker did wrong. The man says that's so true. He heard he is a descendant of the Tang clan. But he keeps trying to use the hammer without permission. Are descendants of the Tang clan not allowed to use hammers? Wool asks. The man then asks Wool if this is his first time in Sichuan. Wool responds and says, you could say that. The man begins to say the Tang clan fell to ruin. It was because they had stood on the demon cult's side long ago. Because of that, they were forced to close their doors by someone titled the strongest in history. And the clan rapidly shriveled up and it was ruined. In the eyes of the Sichuan sects, the Tang clan is a renegade that betrayed the Sichuan Jinghu. That's why no workshop ever passes down their secret techniques to anyone related to the Tang clan. They are afraid that the same history would be repeated. So the descendant pays for the sins of the ancestor, he says. Who told them to stand on the demon cult side, the man asks. It's the price the Tang clan chose for their own accord, he says. The man then asks Wool again what he came to purchase. Wool says he came to purchase a flying sword. Follow me, the man says. All weapons made in the workshop are displayed in the back. As they walk to the back, Wool asks if the man has had a lot of orders coming in lately. The man starts laughing and says, After the Emmy sect and the Qingcheng sect started fighting full scale, the orders have increased twofold. He says the atmosphere in Sichuan became chaotic, but business is booming for us. Even now, all our workshop artisans have their hands full with making weapons ordered by various sects. As the man's talking, Wool notices the Tang clan descendant getting beat. The men beating him are saying, The Tang clan was ruined because they broke rules like this. They are trying to teach him his place. As Sochu is being beaten, he notices a dagger laying on the ground close to him. Wool approaches them and says, Humans truly are more atrocious than beasts. The moment they allow themselves to be devalued, they are pulled and ripped apart until their death. If you make enduring a habit, you'll have to keep living as a lowly dog. Wool walks up to Sochu and asks him, How will he live? The men beating Sochu ask Wool who he is. They tell Wool to stop talking nonsense and go somewhere else. This has to do with the fire dragon room, they say. Wool ignores them and asks Sochu again how he will live. The men get annoyed with Wool and ask if he's ignoring them. And as the man is looking at Wool, Sochu jumps up and bites him in the neck. Sochu takes the man down and the man tries to ask Sochu what he's doing. Sochu then grabs a dagger and puts it to the man's eye. The others from the group are in shock and ask why he's acting like a beast. Sochu gets up and asks, When did you guys ever treat me like a human? You always treated me like a beast, he says. You seriously think you can get away with this, they ask? Do as you like, Sochu says. I'm tired of getting beaten up by you guys for no reason, but keep this in mind, he warns. I'll slit the throat of the next person who messes with me. As the men walk away, Sochu starts to fall from his exhaustion, but Wo is there to catch him. The story continues and Wo is walking Sochu home. Wo takes a quick look around and compliments Sochu on his home. However, Sochu isn't used to anyone complimenting him and asks Wo if he's mocking him. Wo says his home is no different than a palace and he then admits to living in a pit of snakes. Sochu thinks Wo is making that up just to make him feel better. Wo then says he's leaving because he has somewhere to be. Sochu asks Wo where he's headed and Wo asks if Sochu is usually interested in other people's business. Sochu chuckles and says, Wo would have asked the same thing. Wo knows it's true and says, there are some people who owe him. He was used, abandoned, and hunted. Sochu wants to know who they are and if Wo is going to take revenge. Wo says the Chang Chang sect, the Emi sect, and the sects who support them. Sochu can't believe it and says, that's insane. He then asks Wo if he's trying to wage a war against the full force of Sichuan by himself. I may be insane, Wo says. He then asks for the flying dagger he lent to Sochu because he's going to need it. Oh, this piece of garbage, Sochu asks. Wo says, that's not garbage, he spent a tile of silver on it. Sochu searches under his bed and says, Wo will die pretty quickly if he thinks of taking revenge with this dagger. 
Sochu throws Wool a weapon he had hidden under his bed and says, take this instead. Wool loves it as the edge, balance, and durability are perfect. Wool asks Sochu if he had a hard time making it. Sochu says he didn't have a hard time making it, he just didn't have a lot of time because he had to make it in secret. Wool asks Sochu if he's sure it's okay to take. Sochu says of course it is. The Chin Chang sect and the Emi sect are the reason why the Tang Quan fell to ruin. Sochu says he can never forgive them for oppressing and alienating the closed Tang Quan until it's ruined. And besides, he says, Wool was the first person who told him not to endure it. Wool appreciates the kind gesture and begins testing out his new weapon. Wool has gotten used to the dagger quickly and Sochu is amazed. It's as if the flying blades are moving on their own, he thinks. He has to remind himself that his eyes are not playing tricks on him. Wool says he's going to name his new weapon the Phantom Dagger. As Wool walks out the door, he gives Sochu his name. Sochu says he'll pray for his success in Sichuan. Later on in Chengdu, we see a woman holding a meeting. She gives her sincere gratitude to everyone who has gathered here today because of her call. The attendees say they're always prepared to stand together with Lady Wu. She says the Hundred Flower Room's circumstances aren't that great due to the pressure from the Ching Chang sect, but she is relieved that everyone is doing their best to help. The men say they'll protect the Hundred Flower Room no matter how powerful the Ching Chang sect is. They don't have the power all the way in Chengdu. They reassure Lady Wu that she doesn't have to worry about a thing. Lady Wu thanks them and thinks to herself, men are all the same. Nothing but vulgar barbarians. Then, she remembers the Emi sect has issued a summons since the Ching Chang sect has been moving in unusual ways. She tells the men at the table that she won't be able to attend the next meeting. The men eagerly ask if they can also join the Emi sect's ranks. They even go as far as saying they would climb the Emi sect mountain. Lady Wu sheds tears of joy and thinks to herself that the men are only there because of her looks. She can take all the people who mistake her for a flower under her wing and manipulate them. Until the day she becomes the leader of the Emi sect and rules over Sichuan. The meeting ends as they walk down the stairs and Lady Wu sees a new face. She's intimidated by Wool's bright eyes and fair skin. Lady Wu decides to approach Wool and she says she's never seen him around here before. She introduces herself as Lady Wu from the Hundred Flower Room and asks for Wool's name. He agrees and says his name is Wool. Lady Wu wants to know more and asks Wool if he's a martial artist. Wool tells her to think as she likes. Lady Wu doesn't appreciate Wool's cold response and asks why he won't tell her. Wool asks if she always acts so inquisitively when she meets someone for the first time. The men with Lady Wu don't appreciate Wool's tone and demand he apologize to her. Apologize, Wool asks. One of the men didn't catch Wool's vibe and he tells Wool to get on his knees and formally apologize. If you don't, there will be consequences, he says. Wool gets out of his chair and says, There's a limit to how blinded you can be by a woman. Shouldn't you assess your opponent before running rampant, Wool asks. The man gets angry as he doesn't want to be embarrassed in front of Lady Wu and calls for his sword. How dare you mock me, he asks Wool. The man instinctively goes for an attack on Wool, but Wool easily moves out of the way. The man is shocked that Wool dodged his attack so easily. He's now more angry as that's never happened before. The man prepares for another attack with the thunderstorm sword technique of the clear sky house. His comrades are afraid he's actually going to kill Wool. The man moves to strike Wool and once again Wool easily avoids the attack. The man can't believe Wool dodged his attack yet again and is left wondering who Wool is. The man again tries to avoid embarrassment and goes for an attack behind Wool's back. Wool easily avoids them all and walks up to Lady Wu. She is mesmerized by Wool's presence. Now that Wool is done moving, the man tries to sneak up on Wool with one last attack. Wool looks back at the man and asks if that's really the best he can do. Wool gets a hold of the man's chin with two fingers and slams him into the ground. Wool gets up to face Lady Wu and she asks him to release his anger. Lady Wu tells Wool that the man is not a bad person. She says he was aggressive because he was worried about her. Wool says people must always take responsibility for their actions. Lady Wu replies and says, Wool is absolutely right and asks how she can take responsibility for the man. She throws Wool off with this response and he asks if she's really willing to take the responsibility for the man. The man's comrades beg her not to as they'd rather fight with their lives on the line. But Wool realizes what she's doing. She's getting full mileage out of what she has. Wool takes a long look at Lady Wu and he can't help but smirk. Lady Wu has shouldered the responsibility of that man from earlier. 
Lady Wu then asks Wool if he can do her a favor. She says it shouldn't be too difficult for him considering how easily he beat up that man earlier. Wool says he needs to hear the favor first. Nam Hosan, she says. She wants Wool to kill Nam Hosan, the next in line of the Thunder Clan. She says not long ago, the Thunder Clan leader Tae Yun Ho proposed the marriage between her and Nam Hosan. They threatened them by saying they would aid the Chin Chang sect if they refused the proposal putting the Hundred Flower Room and the Emmy Sect in a very difficult position because of him. Wool realizes that because he has no contact with the Hundred Flower Room, Lady Wu must have calculated that she can claim she doesn't know him if he fails. Lady Wu says if Wool kills Nam Ho San for her, she will put in a good word for him with her aunt and make sure he receives a sizable reward. Wool asks who her aunt is. Lady Wu says her aunt is one of the great disciples of the Emmy Sect leader, Ran. She is the pavilion master, Zhang Hua. Is that so? Wool asks with a smile. We're now brought to Mount Emmy, where we see Ranju and one of her comrades have arrived. The view from the mountain is amazing, but it's all meaningless if they lose to the Qin Chang sect in the war. Ranju and her comrade are visiting for a meeting with the Emmy sect. This meeting will include Zhang Hua, Young, and the Abbess of Nine Calamities, Ran. Ran cuts right to the chase and says, There's no way a group of vagabonds would spill blood for free, so you must want something in exchange. Ranju says she is correct as they can't afford to suffer losses after all. Ran asks how much they want and Ranju says they believe 500,000 gold yangs is fair. The Emisec disciples are appalled and Ran has to calm them down. Ran asks Ranju if she actually expects her offer to be accepted. Ran says she can hire multiple groups with that kind of money. Ranju says that's true, but none of them will be as strong as the Blood Cloud Corpse. Ran asks what if she still refuses. Ranju says a member of their corpse should have arrived at Mount Jin Chang by now. You're trying both ways? Ran asks. The impertinence, she yells. As Ranju and her comrade cough up blood, Ran wants them to be honest. She wants to know what their real offer is. Ranju says they are vagabonds who sell their strength to the highest bidder. Our master will be the one who pays even one yang more, she says. Ran says Ranju's corpse member must also be saying the same thing in Mount Qin Chang. Ran believes the Qin Chang sect is already superior to them, and if they hire the vagabonds as well, that'll give them a surefire victory. She wants to dismiss them, but she doesn't know when a conflict will break out, so she needs all the help she can get. Ran orders Zhang Hua to go meet with the vagabonds to negotiate. We now see two men complaining about their business meeting with the Thunder Clan. They're driving a bargain too hard, one of the men says. He says he's completely exhausted every time he does business with the clan. They wonder how much more the clan has to squeeze from them in order to be satisfied. They can't believe the clan is being so cheap when they have two full storage rooms of grains already. The rich are always like that, they say. And as always, watching them and plotting from afar is Wool. As he awaits the return of the Black Cloud Corpse, Muryang yawns. It's exhausting trying to walk on a tight rope between the Emmy sect and the Qin Chang sect. He believes it may be time to think about retirement once this is all over. Daioshi finally returns and says he would have returned sooner, but he saw a familiar face. Daioshi says he told Muryang about him last time. The person they met by coincidence and traveled with along the way. The man named Wool. Muryang says he remembers and Daioshi asks if that bothers him. Muryang says for some reason it does bother him. But it may just be because of the situation they're in with the Qin Chang sect and the Emi sect. Daioshi says if Muryang's senses have a bad feeling about it, it shouldn't be taken lightly. Daioshi then says there are some free members that can tail him since he's curious about him as well. Muryang says he thinks that's an excellent idea. Then, in come Ranju with the disciples from the Emmy sect. Muryang welcomes Zhang Hua and Yang. Muryang asks if he can take the direct arrival of the great disciples of the Emmy sect as confirmation that the Emmy sect is willing to make a deal. Zhang Hua says if Muryang is trying to deceive her sect with mediocre strength, they will make sure the Black Cloud Corpse pays dearly, even if they have to postpone the war against the Qin Chang sect. Muryang smiles and invites them in. The negotiations begin and Zhang Hua thinks Muryang is crazy for wanting trading rights beyond the Great Wall. She says a vagabond should act like one and receive gold for payment. Zhang Hua tells Muryang he is too greedy. But Muryang doesn't think so. He says it's well within the realm of possibilities if the Emmy sect becomes ruler of Sichuan. Zhang Hua is starting to get fed up with Muryang and breaks the table. 
Zhang Hua can't contain her anger as she knows Mer Yang knows he has the advantage. Mer Yang says in that case he'll give up on the trading rights and he won't ask for the 500,000 gold yangs either. He says he won't even ask for compensation for the table and teacup Zhang Hua just broke. Mer Yang asks if they can instead help them get settled near the western plateau. Zhang Hua asks if that's what Mer Yang was aiming for from the start, a place to settle. Mer Yang says, as you know, Zhang Hua, we are a group of vagabonds. No sect wants us to settle near them. Zhang Hua says, the same goes for our sect. Mer Yang says, that is why I'm suggesting we settle near the western plateau, far away from the Emi sect. You can allow something like that, can't you? He asks. Zhang Hua takes a second to think. She believes they'd be indispensable to them in the short run if she accepts, but they may become a burden in the future. However, if we use them as meat shields, their forces will dwindle and not much of them will be left, she thinks. Providing the few who remain a place to settle isn't difficult and they can be disposed of when they become a problem. Very well then, we accept your proposal, Zhang Hua says. Negotiations are complete then, Mer Yang says. Mer Yang is excited as he thinks things wouldn't have gone this well if he was negotiating with the Ching Chang sect. Mer Yang asks if they should write up a contract, but Zhang Hua says there's no need. They will uphold the proposal in the name of the Emi sect. Mer Yang asks if they will now be headed back to the Emi sect. He offers them a room if they'd like to stay for a day. Zhang Hua says they will stay in the Hundred Flower Room as the young master there is her niece. Then, Rainju barges in and says she has urgent news. Mer Yang gets angry and asks how urgent could the news be for her to barge in like this. Rainju says the young leader of the Thunder Clan was assassinated. How? Was the assassin captured? Mer Yang asks. Doesn't seem like it. And I think the Thunder Clan is sure that this is the Ching Chang sect's doing, Rainju says. At the Ching Chang sect, the Thunder Clan leader Tay arrives unannounced. The Ching Chang sect disciples have no idea what's going on because the clan has come armed. The Ching Chang sect leader meets with Tay and asks what's going on. Tay says he's come to ask him the same thing. The Ching Chang sect leader says he needs to hear the full story as to why Tay has brought a coffin. Tay says inside this coffin is his disciple's corpse. The Ching Chang sect leader offers his condolences and asks Tay what he thinks their sect has to do with it. Tay gets angry and asks if he truly doesn't understand. The sect leader says he truly doesn't understand and wants Tay to explain. Very well, in that case, I will show you myself, Tay says. Inside the coffin is young leader of the Thunder Clan, Nam Hosan. Look at this boy's wounds, Tay says. They are no doubt the wounds from the Ching Chang sect's 72 sword waves. The sect leader starts sweating as they are indeed wounds from the 72 sword waves. Tay asks the sect leader if he will continue to make excuses after seeing the body. His disciple has clearly passed away due to the Chin Chang sect's 72 sword waves. Tay says the only possible explanation is that the culprit is the Chin Chang sect. Tay thinks they must have realized they were planning on backing the Emmy sect through matrimony with the Hundred Flower Room. He's sure the Chin Chang sect made their move first after realizing it. The sect leader begs Tay to calm down and says he will get to the bottom of this. But Tay asks how he can possibly stay calm when his disciple died from the Ching Chang sect sword technique. Here is the proof, he says, so what are you trying to get to the bottom of? Tay wants the Ching Chang sect leader to explain himself this instant. Then, the Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior has heard enough. How dare you act in such a way after coming to the Ching Chang sect unannounced, he asks. He says this is unforgivable. He then rushes Tay and hits him with the thunderstorm palm. Do you find our sect that laughable, to the point that you would try to persecute us with such an outrageous accusation, he asks. The sect leader is upset at the greatest warrior for the attack. The greatest warrior walks away and says, We would only be a laughingstock if we gave them the attention. It's not too late to figure out what's going on after neutralizing them. The sect leader notices that his junior brother has changed. He has become violent and reckless. Though he was cold in the past, he was never that frenzied. As Tay's disciples check up on him, Tay asks the sect leader if this was the aim of the Ching Chang sect. To neutralize with force to suppress any form of objection, the Ching Chang sect leader can't respond. He tells his junior brother to speak with Tay when he gets up and gives the Thunder Clan warriors a place to stay as well. The Ching Chang sect leader then tells his disciple Chang to head to Chengdu. Something is amiss there and he wants to know what. Back in Chengdu, we see two men conversing in the hall. One wonders if the Ching Chang sect really killed Nam Hosan. 
It's been said that traces of martial arts can be easily forged, but the other says the more superior the martial art is, the more distinct its traces are. Traces of a martial art like the 72 sword waves can't be imitated. It may actually be true then that the Ching Cheng sect are really to blame for Nam Hosan's death. They believe at this rate a storm of blood may engulf the entirety of Chengdu. Little do they know, they just walked past the room of the real suspect. As Wool sits at his table, Lady Wu walks in and asks how he did it. Do what? Wool asks. Young Lord Nam Hosan of the Thunder Clan, she says. She asks Wool what he did for the Thunder Clan leader to be so furious and accuse the Ching Cheng sect of being the culprit. Wool acts clueless and asks, who knows? Lady Wu, confused, aren't you the one who killed him, she asks. Why does it matter who the killer is, Wool responds. He says, what's more important is that he's dead. Don't you think, Wool asks. He grabs Lady Wu by the chin and leans in for a kiss. She says, yes, you're right, but pulls away. She says it'll be hard for her to meet with him for a while because she has received an important guest. Wool asks who. Lady Wu says, I told you before that the Emisek's first disciple, Zhang Hua, is my aunt. She's come to the Hundred Flower Room along with her junior sister. She has quite a fussy personality, so I have to attend to her personally. What is Zhang Hua doing in Chengdu? Wu asks. Lady Wu says she heard that Zhang Hua is there to hire a vagabond group called the Blood Cloud Corps. She says she's heard they are quite powerful among the vagabond groups and apparently their leader is very intelligent. Wu asks Lady Wu when Zhang Hua will go back to the Emmy sect. Lady Wu says she thinks she'll be staying in the Hundred Flower Room for a while. It's a pleasure seeing my aunt, but having to see that junior sister of hers, who I can't stand the sight of, leaves a bitter feeling, she says. Lady Wu leaves, and Wu is left wondering if by Zhang Hua's junior sister, she meant young. She was cool-headed and menacing. He thinks he might see her again while staying in Chengdu. He's sure the Qin Cheng sect is in an uproar as well, now that Nam Hosan is dead. He says to himself he'll just have to wait a little longer. We're given a flashback of the 72 wave sword technique being activated and performed masterfully by Wool. The Qin Cheng sect disciples have arrived at the crime scene and are looking for clues. They are shocked to see that the traces without a doubt belong to their sex technique. Chong wonders if this could have been done by an outsider. His comrade believes it could have been, but it's near impossible for an outsider to have learned a secret technique that only a select few have even learned within the sect. Chong says a transcript was leaked once, but the transcript only contained the sword movements. Chong's comrade says if they didn't learn their sex cultivation technique, a single person wouldn't be able to bring out even half of its true power. Chong then asks if he thinks it was a sect. The Qin Cheng sect disciple says that would change things. They'd be able to create a cultivation technique by reverse engineering the movements. However, considering its efficiency, it'd be better to just create a new martial art at that point. They realize they won't be able to come to a conclusion and decide to figure out how the assassin infiltrated instead. As they're retracing the assassin's steps, Chong wonders if this could have been the assassin they saw seven years ago. But then he shuts that idea down quickly because he's sure he's dead. They leave the scene and are headed to the inn for some rest. On their way to the inn, they run into the Emmy sect. Both sects get riled up as they come face to face. Chang says, it's been a while, Zhang Hua. What scraps have you come all the way here to nibble on? Zhang Hua asks. They bicker for a moment and then Yang suggests they withdraw for now. Zhang Hua tells her to shut up as she doesn't want to turn tail to these Ching Chang bastards. Did you kill the young leader of the Thunder Clan while knowing he was going to be betrothed to the young leader of the Hundred Flower Room? Zhang Hua asks. She then says she's impressed they've thrown their humanity away so easily. Chang says like she's one to talk. They invested seven years into killing their sex most promising prospect. Young knew it would end up like this. She wonders where it all went wrong. She recalls they were the ones who started this, but they didn't actually think the assassin would kill Wu Gun Sang. He's long dead, but we're still wrapped around his fingers, she thinks. She realizes she doesn't even know his name. Then, she gets a cold gaze and wonders who it is. But she doesn't see anyone, so she thinks she may have been mistaken. Her senses are as sharp as ever, Wool says to himself. He needed an appropriate ember to light the fire of conflict, but quite the big shots have already gathered. It's not a bad start, he thinks to himself. The story continues on a starry night in Chengdu. Rangu asks Wool where he's been this whole time. She says it feels like she's been waiting forever. 
Wolf thought he was meeting with Rangu alone, but it turns out he's also meeting with Muryang and Daioshi. They eat dinner together and Muryang introduces himself as the captain of the Black Cloud Corps. Muryang tells Wolf that he's heard a lot about him. He also says that Rangu has taken a great interest in him, so he wanted to meet him at least once. Now that the two are meeting face to face, Muryang can see how strong Wool is. Muryang says to Wool, Though you're concealing that intense energy of yours very well by drawing attention to your flashy attire and appearance, you cannot hide everything. The energy that leaks out of you is abnormal. Ranju is feeling good about the interaction so far. Muryang says he's going to get straight to the point and tries to recruit Wool to the Black Cloud Corps. He says people only view them as a group of vagabonds, but he has a dream. Muryang's dream is to make the Black Cloud Corps an acknowledged sect. To make that happen, he knows he needs every capable person they can get. Muryang says he's willing to offer Wool anything he desires. He says he'd even offer him Ranju, and Daioshi can't wait to watch what happens next. He thinks it's interesting that Ranju is acting like she's not interested in Wool when he knows the truth. Daioshi is eager to see how Wool will respond. Wool says that's not an attractive offer and Daioshi can't keep his drink in. He apologizes for the interruption and tells them to continue. Muryang turns back to Wool and asks what's not to like, joining the corpse or Ranju. Wool says everything. I'd rather not lay my hands on food that's obviously bound to spoil. Ranju can't believe she's just been rejected. There's an awkward moment of silence and Muryang bursts out laughing. He says it was just a joke. He stands up and says to Wool he has no idea how valuable Ranju is. Muryang offers Wool a piece of advice. He says, try not to come face to face with our corpse. I like to have conversations, but the others like to take action first. Wool says, let me say something as well. If you're suddenly beheaded while walking down the road one day, you can think of it as my doing. Muryang nervously smirks and Wool says it's just the joke, but Muryang's not laughing. Later on, a Ching Chang sect disciple returns with an update to Chang. Chang wants to know what the Emi sect is up to. The disciple says the Emi sect hasn't taken a single step out of the Hundred Flower Room. He says he's dispatched a few of the disciples around the Hundred Flower Room just in case. Chang says they have to track down the scoundrel who killed the young leader of the Thunder Clan as soon as possible. That way, they can unveil the truth and take the necessary countermeasures. The Disciple says they'd know the movements in the backwaters best. He says he's sure they know who approached everyone on the Thunder Clan that day since their eyes are spread all over Sichuan like a spider web. Chong says he'd rather not use them but leaves it up to the Disciple. The Disciple says he will not disappoint. Chong looks out into the night sky and thinks, more sects are involved in this than he expected. The Thunder Clan? the Golden Heaven Clan, and even the Hundred Flower Room. Who knows how many problems could arise if the assassin is not caught quickly. Down the street, we see a spy trying to collect information on Wool. He was sure that he'd receive confirmation of him being inside, but he can't feel his presence at all. The spy knows Wool is extraordinary, but he can't believe that he can't even hear a single breath. The spy looks out the window and gives the signal. The signal is accepted and taken back to Yang, the Black Cloud Corps Vice Captain. The ninja says to Yang, the first class surveillance target has made no movements all night. And now that the sun will rise, they will switch from long range surveillance to close range. Good, Yang says. The captain seems to be quite bothered by him, so tell them to continue surveilling him without dropping their guard even for a moment. The ninja heads off to deliver the message and Yang decides to get back to work. He's analyzing a problem with the gates at the foot of Mount Ching Chang. He recalls, the power of the Black Cloud Corpse cannot be used in these gates. They need to drag them down to the foot of the mountain to effectively make use of their 200 horses. As he thinks how he could make that happen, he senses something wrong and throws daggers to the ceiling. He sees nothing there and wonders if he's being overly sensitive. Yang was sure he felt something but believes he may have been mistaken since he's so on edge. Meanwhile, at the Hundred Flower Room, Zhang Hua tells Yang to go back to Mount Emmy. Yang asks why. Zhang Hua says there's nothing for her to do anymore now that the negotiation was a success, and it'd be best for her to return to Ran. Yang says she can't go back because they can clash with the Ching Cheng sect in Chengdu at any moment. Yang wants to stay and support Zhang Hua. Zhang Hua says, worst case scenario, she'll just use the Black Cloud Corpse as her meat shields. She wants Yang to do as she says. Yang sighs and accepts Zhang Hua's request, though she clearly does not want to. Zhang Hua tells Yang she can leave first thing in the morning. After Yang leaves the room, Lady Wu enters. Lady Wu says she thought Zhang Hua would like some company. 
Zhang Wa appreciates the thought and asks Lady Wu if she's seen anyone. She noticed her complexion looks much healthier. Lady Wu says she is and he has quite the use to him. She then spits out that she thinks the man she's seen is the one who killed the young leader of the Thunder Clan. Zhang Wa is shocked and asks if she is certain. Lady Wu realizes she may have revealed too much information and says she has no proof. She also says she'd introduce him to her when she finds out if he did it or not. Zhang Wa asks for his name, and before Lady Wu can tell her, they're interrupted. The two run to see what's going on and the disciples say, Go is dead. They believe this was the Chin Chang sect's doing. Fuel has now been added to the fire. The next morning, Mer Yang and his vice captain, Yang, head to the flower room. Mer Yang informs his vice captain that an Emisec disciple was found dead. He worries he may have chosen the wrong side of the war. Yang says this isn't terrible news as they might need them even more now. But the fact that there's an assassin of this level in Sichuan is strange. After the fall of the Blood Shadow group seven years ago, not a single assassin group has set foot in Sichuan. As they wonder who it could be, Mer Yang says there's no way a prestigious orthodox sect like the Ching Chang sect could have hired an assassin. Yang suggests a third party could have intervened. One person comes to mind for Mer Yang. Mer Yang then asks if their spy reported anything unordinary. Yang says the spy reported that Wu hasn't set foot outside in four days. Yang knows the spy is very talented, so there isn't a doubt in his mind. Mer Yang asks Yang if he's sure it couldn't have been Wu. Yang says considering the circumstances until now, yes. Mer Yang trusts his vice captain, so he tells him to tell the spy to stop watching Wu for now and focus on figuring out the Ching Chang sex movements. Mer Yang and his vice captain meet with Zhang Hua and offer their condolences. Zhang Hua says she called them here today because she wants them to look at her disciples' wounds. She thought they were simple wounds at first, but quickly realized they weren't. Mer Yang takes a look and is puzzled. The wounds are overly thin and sharp, so it can't be a sword or a dowel. He thinks maybe a silver wire. But no matter how sharp a silver wire is, there's no way it would have prevented the skin from curling up. Not even someone as experienced as you have seen something like this before, Zhang Hua asks. Mer Yang says that's correct. Zhang Hua then asks if there's anyone he suspects. Wu comes to his mind once again, but it can't be him, he thinks. Mer Yang apologizes to Zhang Hua and says he can't give her the answers she desires. Zhang Hua asks when all of Mer Yang's forces will return to Chengdu. Mer Yang says they will all return in two days, but the Qing Chen sect will be wary if the cavalry men enter Chengdu. Zhang Hua says she doesn't care. They will crush them in a flash. Mer Yang asks if she is planning on waging a frontal assault right away. Zhang Hua says she said she would give Mer Yang what he wanted so he shouldn't be afraid. She says she'd rather die than live under the same sky as the Ching Chang sect. Mer Yang and his vice captain understand but no one notices who's behind her. The night time comes and we're brought to the hospital. We see one of Mer Yang's men severely injured. Mer Yang asks to know what happened to O. Oh. Ranju says they went to see Wu and got completely messed up. Furious, Mer Yang demands to hear the whole story. Ranger recalls the story and starts from the beginning. Ranger spotted Wu eating and approached him. Wu clearly wanted to eat in peace. Ranju said she was just checking up on him. She wanted to apologize for being disrespectful during their meeting with Mer Yang. Wu said he didn't care. Ranju tried to act like his response didn't bother her, but it did. She then asks Wu to think about Mer Yang's offer again. But as they were conversing, they were interrupted by O. Oh. Irritated she was no longer alone with Wu, Ranju asked O oh why he was following her. O oh said he was just coming to get her because Mer Yang wanted her. O oh then introduced himself to Wu. Ranju noticed O oh had no intentions of leaving, so she got even more annoyed. O oh tried striking a conversation with Wu, but Ranju wanted him to stop. Wu said he'd give O oh one chance to leave him alone. He told him to turn away before he counted to three. Wu said if he didn't, he'd make it so that O oh can't see anything until the day he dies. Clearly unaware of what Wu was capable of, O oh began to count down himself. He reached a count of three and he didn't move. Wu took his chopsticks and went right for O's oh eyes. Surprisingly, O oh was prepared and blocked the attack. O oh then went for an attack of his own, but he never had a chance of actually hitting. Wu oh evaded and began his own attack. Ranju tried to stop the fight as she knew things were about to get worse, but it was too late. O oh was suffocated and severely injured. Wu then picked up O's oh head and shoved his fingers right into his eyes. Wu was done and ready to walk away, but Ranju was not happy. She sent an attack at Wu, but when he turned to face her, she offered a truce. 
She told Wool she didn't come to see him for a fight, and Oh has already paid the price for interrupting them. She said there's no more blood to spill. Without words, Wool accepted and turned away. Ranju took a sigh of relief and had a final message for Wool. She told him he's really unpredictable. And despite everything Oh did, she couldn't believe Wool took it that far. She told Wool to be careful. If he keeps acting as he likes without caution, he won't be able to avoid unexpected misfortune. Her threat meant nothing to Wool and he walked away. He was just upset his clothes were ruined because his girlfriend from the brothel gave them to him. After hearing Ranju's story, Muryang is left baffled. He's angry to have lost such an important member at such a crucial time. Ranju says at this point her pride is so hurt she can't handle it. She vows to make sure Wool will pay for this humiliation. Muryang says that's a good choice. They can dispose of him once the matter with the Ching Chang sect is resolved. Ranju agrees. As they go their separate ways, Muryang says they'll make their move as soon as they regroup with the cavalrymen. Make ample preparations, Ranju responds. Later on, we see Chong meeting with the ignoble clan branch manager. Chong wants to find the culprit who killed the young leader of the Thunder Clan. The manager says that's as difficult as finding a needle in the haystack. The only clue is that they use a martial art of the Ching Chang sect. Chong asks if there are any rumors of anyone standing out in Chengdu. The manager says there is one, a man named Wool. They say he possesses beauty that can charm others and is a ruthless master whose skill can't be described with words. Chong asks if that means he has something to do with the death of the Thunder Clan's young leader. The branch manager says that he doesn't know, but he does know he fits the conditions of people that Chong is looking for best. Chong makes his payment and walks away. As the manager reflects on this interaction, he wonders if Wool could be the culprit. He grabs one of his books and looks up Wool's name. The manager doesn't find out much about Wool that isn't already known. He asks himself if this could really be the assassin that killed Nam Hosan. The manager plans to send this information to the headquarters so they could handle it. In doing so, Wool will have to live under the ignoble clan's watchful eyes. But to his surprise, Wool was watching him the whole time. Now he can't move and Wool takes his book. Wool's soul reaping thread is a wire made from his chi, invisible to the eye of everyone. The manager turns to Wool and asks who he is. Wool says he's impressed that the manager has investigated him. He says it hasn't even been that long since he's entered Chengdu. The manager says the ignoble clan will not stand for it if Wool harms him. Wool says he knows and that's why he's there. The manager asks why, and Wool says he doesn't like his information spreading around without his permission. The manager realizes who he's talking to and asks if it's Wool. Wool says he's right. The manager wonders why Wool is exposing his identity like this and wonders if Wool is trying to silence him by killing him. The manager begs Wool to spare his life as no one has seen the book yet. Wool says that's laughable because he was saying Wool's name very openly earlier. The manager begins to panic and tries to break free. The manager breaks loose for a second and tries to attack Wool with his pushing shadow hand. Wool is not phased and uses his soul reaping thread to finish the manager. Wool leaves the manager lifeless and takes his book. Somewhere in Chengdu, there's an explosion. The Qin Cheng sect and the Emi sect are facing off. Buildings are on fire and Muryang feels as if he's living in a nightmare. The two sects fight as they've both reached their tipping points. Muryang and the Black Cloud corpse are left watching. The Fire Dragon Room Master, Poe, yells for everyone to stop fighting, but he gets hit in the crossfire. Poe's clan retaliates and they join in on the war. Muriang is in disbelief. He says the Emi sect is currently at a disadvantage because they lack forces. Muriang has no choice and summons the entire Black Cloud Corpse. He is prepared to join the fray. The war continues and Zhang Hua joins in. She charges right towards the Qin Chang sect. Zhang Hua then faces off with Chang. How dare you send an assassin to kill my disciple? And how could Qin Chang still call itself a reputable sect of the Zheng Hu? She asks. Chang says, you were the ones who crossed the Qin Chang sect first. And you hired an assassin to kill Wu Gun Sang. Are you not the ones behind the murder of the Thunder Clan's young leader as well? He asks. Zhang Hua says she heard the assassin use the sword technique of the Qin Chang sect. She then rushes Chong for trying to pit this on them. As she attacks, she yells, One of us will be buried here today. Chong is ready for battle. As they clash, Yang is trying to do her part in the war. She fights off a few Qing Chang sect disciples, but she is unable to protect the disciple with her. Yang cries for her junior sister and tells her to circulate her aura. But the disciple is in too much pain and she can't. 
The disciple passes and Young breaks down. While holding the lifeless disciple, Young thinks about how this whole war was instigated by the Emmy sect. That's why she was hesitant to join the war against the Ching Chang sect, but because of her indecisiveness, the sect's disciples are now dying. She tells herself she can't keep dodging the issue any longer. Another explosion goes off near Mer Yang, and he wonders where his forces are. Mer Yang calls for Seo, one of his members. He says, things are flowing strangely. The people who went to gather the forces haven't returned and everything just feels contrived. As if someone is adding fuel to the flames. Mer Yang tells Seo to leave the battle and search the area. Check if there really is such a person. As Seo flies over the war, he thinks this is the epitome of madness. Both forces have put the assassination incident aside and are simply tearing each other apart. The captain is right. There must be someone inciting such a situation to happen. He wonders where such a person would be. Since there are battles everywhere you go, they wouldn't be in a building that could collapse at any moment. And there doesn't seem to be anyone like that among those fighting either. He tries hard to think of where they could possibly be. Then he sees the tree that is considered to be sacred in Chengdu. It's perfect enough to be able to view all the surroundings. Seo hops on the tree and checks if the person is hiding inside. Then, from the corner of his eye, Seo sees someone is hiding in the tree. Someone in a black warrior robe with red eyes. The man activates his daggers and Seo is amazed at the skill. The daggers are headed right towards him and he wonders if this is a telekinetic sword technique. He doesn't understand how a master like this could be in Chengdu. Seo was no match and is now being strangled by the man. As Seo fights for air, the man approaches him and finishes him off. Then, the man goes back to watching the war from a distance. He watches as Zhang Hua has fallen to Chang. Chang stands victorious and Zhang Hua is severely injured. Yang rushes to her side and asks if she's alright. Zhang Hua can't answer and Yang takes her back to the Hundred Flower Room. As Chang watches them leave, his junior brothers rush in for help, but Chang says it's time to go as well. Both sects withdraw their forces as Zhang Hua's wounds are serious. This is all news that the disguised man, Wool, likes to hear. The next morning, Yang is shown two corpses. He asks who killed these people and Daioshi says they were killed by the same person. The marks on their necks are identical. Based on the size and shape of the wounds, the assailant probably used either a short sword or a dagger. Muryang then recalls O's wounds were caused by daggers as well. He calls for O and he was right. The wounds are exactly the same. Muryang knows exactly what this means. Wol is the one who killed the ignoble clan branch manager and CO. Muryang demands for Wol to be brought to him immediately. He says he'll interrogate him himself. Back at the Hundred Flower Room, two disciples are discussing the severity of Zhang Hua's injuries. As they contemplate what's next, Young tells them to pull themselves together. She says to check the defenses of the Hundred Flower Room because the Qin Cheng sect can attack at any second. She also wants a messenger pigeon sent to the main sect right away. Young wants to inform them of everything that's happened and call for reinforcements. Young believes the deaths of her disciple and the Thunder Clan's young leader increased the hostility between the two sects and it grew way out of hand. She knows someone is intentionally causing strife between the two sects, but she needs to find out who. Inside, Zhang Hua lays on her bed. Her injuries are critical and she needs to stay as calm as possible. But she doesn't want any advice from the doctor and tells him to get lost before she cuts his head off. He exits the room and she thinks of the sorry state she's in. She doesn't want Young to take initiative so she wants to recover quickly. The door opens and Zhang Hua thinks it's the doctor again. Without looking up, she tells him to get lost. After not receiving a response, she looks up and asks this person who he is. Don't you remember me? He asks Zhang Hua. He approaches Zhang Hua and she asks if he knows her. Of course, the man responds. I've never forgotten you for a single moment in the past seven years. I wonder if you'll remember if I blind the last eye you have, he asks. Then, Zhang Hua remembers. It's Wol from back then. Long time no see, Wol says. How are you here, Zhang Hua asks. You definitely died back then. The Qin Cheng sect's greatest warrior threw you into the snake hole, she says. Yeah, he did, Wol says. But now it's time for me to mess you up. I'm the one, he says. The person who killed your disciple and the Thunder Clan's young leader. How dare you kill our disciple, Zhang Hua responds. Are you trying to make an enemy of the Emmy sect? After killing one of us, do you think it's easy to continue with the rest? Are you not afraid at all, she asks. She asks all this, not calmly. Zhang Hua is clearly suffering. You guys made me this way, Wol says. 
We were all your creations. Without you guys, there's no way we could have been reborn as assassins. In pain, Zhang Wa asks Wu what he wants. He says he doesn't want anything. He just wants to let her know what will happen to the Emmy sect from now on. Wu says it'll be good for them, because he's going to kill Chong of the Qin Chang today. He'll be killed by one of the ultimate techniques of the Emmy sect, the Snow Cloud Piercing Strike. And it just so happens that Young uses the Snow Cloud Piercing Strike. Zhang Hua can't take it anymore and says she ought to kill Wu right now. Wu says the Ching Chang sect and the Emmy sect will spill each other's blood. Both sides will end up with huge losses. The blood of the monsters crouching in the mountains will also be spilled. People like Ran and the Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior. Zhang Hua wants to get rid of Wu so badly but she has no life left. Wu says he will pull everyone out from hiding and he'll make sure to devour everyone. Zhang Hua uses her last breath of air to call Wu a bastard. And she collapses. Wu says she should have never created something like him. Someone as horrifying as he is. The story continues at the inn, where the Black Cloud Corps begins their search for Wu. But as always, Wu is a few steps ahead. As they brainstorm where Wu could be, Rainju admits she feels stupid for falling for Wu's looks. She promises to skin him alive if she ever sees him again. Daioshi and Hayu try to stay productive, but Daioshi fears Wu is out causing more trouble. At the Golden Heaven Clan, we see two disciples taking a break from training. As they discuss what's been going on in Chengdu, there's a huge explosion. As they hurry inside to see what happened, they recognize the sounds and lights coming from the explosion. It was the snow cloud piercing strike. They believe the Emmy sect has infiltrated the place with Chong inside. We're now shown the events leading up to the strike. Chong is practicing his martial art, but he's unable to relax as he has an unexpected visitor. Chong expects trouble because the visitor approached quietly. Wu introduces himself and Chong recalls hearing the name from the ignoble clan branch manager. Chong asks Wu what he's doing here in the middle of the night. Wu says anyone visiting secretly in the middle of the night is always up to no good. And the same goes for him. Chong admits that was a bad question and tells Wu he has another. Chong asks Wu if he killed the Thunder Clan's young leader. Wu says he did. Why, did you have any grudges against our sect? Chong asks. Wu says he needed the Ching Chang sect for his plan. He has grudges against both the Ching Chang sect and the Emmy sect. Chong knows that means Wu was also the one to kill the Emmy sect's disciple. Chong notices Wu has grudges against everyone and asks for more information on who Wu is. Wu says he's an assassin. The Emmy sect made him an assassin and the Ching Chang sect made him a public enemy in Sichuan. Chong begins putting the pieces together and asks if Wu is the assassin from seven years ago, the one who killed Wu Gun Sang. Wu says he's him. Chong grabs his sword and warns Wu that he's made a huge mistake. He says Wu could have kept his life if he stayed hidden. Chong tells Wu he's going to end his horrible life right now. Just what Wu wanted to hear. Chong rushes at Wu and Wu prepares his own attack. As Chong initiates, Wu has his daggers aimed right at him. Chong jumps up for a strike and Wu puts up one finger. With one finger, Chong is suffocated by Wu's soul reaping thread. Chong realizes he's no match for Wu. As his goodbye, Wu tells Chong to send his greetings to Zhang Wu. And the battle ends with an explosion, which is what the two disciples saw from outside the building. When the disciples reach Chong, Chong uses his last breath to say they've created a monster. The disciples rush to blame the Emmy sect, which is exactly what Wu wanted, and they are prepared to take revenge. Once the reason appeared, it took just an instant for mass bloodshed to occur. People killed each other day and night, over and over again. The suspicion that someone might be behind this soon disappeared. No one cared about it anymore. All they wanted was to be able to kill the enemies in front of them. As Young walks through the battlefield, all she can say is that this feels like hell. She tries to think of how things got so far, but then she is called by Mer Yang. He says he has something to tell her about the killings that have taken place recently, along with some information about a person named Wu. We return to Mount Emmy, where Ran mourns the loss of Zhang Wang. She's told the killer's name is Wu. He is the assassin who killed Wu Gun Sang seven years ago. He's also the one escalating the war between the Ching Chang sect and the Emmy sect. Ran asks how this could have happened. 
How could he have learned the emisex snow cloud piercing strike? One of the disciples who died in the cave carried a secret manual around. She says Wall may have retrieved that copy. Irate, she asks why anyone would carry a secret manual around. The disciple says she's only the messenger and that's not confirmed just yet. Rand says there's no way the Chin Chang sect would accept such reasoning. She says they have no choice but to capture Wool. The disciple volunteers, but Rand says no. She will capture him herself. Ran wants to punish Wool for mocking the Great Emmy sect. Back in Chengdu at the Fire Dragon Room, Wool meets up with his old pal Sochu. Wool jokes this place hasn't changed. Sochu is still making great weapons that kill humans. Wool wants Sochu to decide how he should deal with these guys who make others suffer while thinking they're so noble. Sochu tells Wool he'll do whatever he wants as long as he kills them all. Wool says alright and wants to show Sochu something. Wool takes the man and tells Sochu to make sure he's watching. Wool wanted Sochu to watch the dagger he made him in action. This brought joy to Sochu. As they walk the streets of Chengdu together, Wool uses the dagger to take out the remaining nobles. Wool asks Sochu what he thinks and Sochu says it's truly incredible. He can't believe the weapon he made is able to unleash such power. Thanks to Wool, Sochu was able to get his revenge. Sochu then asks Wool if he needs his help. He then bows to Wool and begs to help him. We now see the Thunder Clan leader Tay running for his life. He's running from the Ching Chang sect's greatest warrior. The greatest warrior strikes Tay and takes his life. The Ching Chang sect leader asks what's going on. He wants to know why the greatest warrior just took Tay's life. The greatest warrior Mew says, Chong died because of him. The sect leader says, Chong didn't die because of Tay. Mew replies by saying he provided the cause for Chong's death. He wants to make sure he's clear and says he won't be sparing the lives of anyone who is related to the death of Chong. The sect leader is in disbelief. To think Mew's murderous intent is so intense. The sect leader wonders what could have happened to Mew in that cave seven years ago for him to have fallen so deep into his inner demons. Mew says, seven years ago, they lost Wu Gun Sang because of the Emmy sex tricks. And now, they've lost Chong. He's worried the future of the Ching Chain sect has been destroyed. The sect leader tries to calm him down, but Mew says he can't hold back anymore. He says he's listened to him long enough, and look where that's gotten them. Mew says, don't stop him. He can no longer overlook what's going on. Mew flies away, and the sect leader's younger brother Ha says, if Mew joins up with Jin, there's going to be big trouble. The sect leader says Jin has been locked up ever since his son's death seven years ago. He's surprised there hasn't been much movement with all this chaos. Ha says it's because he still hasn't been able to get over his hatred for the Emmy sect. He thinks if Jin and Mew meet up and work together, there will be bloodshed across all of Sichuan. Ha offers to investigate because things are so strange. He thinks he'll be able to reveal the truth. The sect leader tells Ha to take some disciples with him just in case. He says if he needs to use force to subdue Mew, he may. It's also important to assist Mew with his inner battle, he says. As Ha leaves, the sect leader tells him that the fate of the Ching Cheng sect is in his hands. Back in Chengdu, Wu is reviewing the Ignoble Clan branch manager's book. He reviews the information on the Black Cloud Corps. He finds out the captain is Mer Yang and he needs to be wary of Daioshi and Hayu. Wu is impressed with all the information in this book. The Ignoble Clan is definitely top-notch, he thinks. They have information not just of the Chengdu martial artists, but also of all of Sichuan's martial artists. He thinks memorizing them all will come in handy someday. He looks out at the war and thinks about the many who have died and those who are probably still dying. Even with all the deaths, he doesn't regret what he's caused. Any sense of guilt ceased to exist in that underground cave. From the moment he was imprisoned underground, the only thing that's mattered to him is his survival. It's too late to turn back now. He doesn't know any other way of living anymore. He knows he can't give up. He won't stop. Not even if he falls. He's going to keep going until the end, even if the end of his life might be somewhere among those flames. At the Hundred Flower Room, Emisec disciples fight to aid those who are injured, but they've run out of medicine and are unsure if they can get any more. Young notifies them not to worry. She's already called for more medicine and it should be arriving by noon. Young wants everyone to focus on treatment and recovery, not about the supplies. Meryang is impressed by Young. He's shocked she's been able to get the supplies even in such a dire situation. He thinks she's incredible. He thinks it's strange that he hasn't heard of her until now. Daioshi says he's heard the Emisec possesses the best talent that has appeared in the past 100 years. They generally keep a low profile and Zhangwa must have been very wary of her. 
meaning she's had to stay hidden all this time. But now that Jungwa is dead, Young can use her talent all she wants. She knows how to assign the right people to the right task and is exceptional in commanding people. He believes if Young becomes the Emisec leader, the Emisec will be able to rise again. But as they're conversing, they notice someone's presence. It's Ran, the Emisec leader, and she has arrived in Chengdu. The Emisec disciples pay their respects. Mariang says to Daioshi, this incident must be pretty important for it to be worth her looking into personally. Young pays her respects, but Ran is clearly not happy. And surprisingly, Lady Wu from the Hundred Flower Room also pays her respects to Ran. Ran shows no emotion, and Lady Wu wonders if she made a mistake. Ran then tells everyone to head inside. She then turns back to Muryang and Daioshi and says she wants them inside too. Muryang and Daioshi nervously whisper to each other and wonder if it's too late to get out of this. But unfortunately for them, they have no other choice. Inside the Hundred Flower Room, Young debriefs Ran with everything there is to know about the incident. Wool, Ran says. And as Ran says Wall's name, Lady Wu gets nervous. Ran asks Lady Wu if she has anything to say. Pardon? Lady Wu asks. Ran asks Lady Wu how she's related to Wool. Lady Wu asks for clarification as she's afraid to speak. Ran grabs a hold of Lady Wu and asks her how she's related to Wool. Ran says to her, look me straight in the eye. I don't like people lying to me. Why were you restless when this man's name was mentioned? Lady Wu stutters. She says, my apologies. I really didn't know things would turn out like this. I just wanted to make use of him. I didn't think this would happen. If you assign a few people to me, I'll capture him and bring him here. I'll clean up this whole mess. He trusts me, so he'll fall into my trap easily. Ran then grabs a hold of her again. Who asked you to kill the Thunder Clan's young leader? Ran asks. All you had to do was live like a flower among men like you usually do. Lady Wu says she made a mistake and she'll live like a flower from now on. Young senses something wrong. She yells out Ran's name, but it's too late. As Lady Wu laid lifeless, Ran asks why someone like her would try to use her brain. But Young yells again. She is furious. Young tells Ran there was no need to go that far. It's not like she did it on purpose. She says Ran shouldn't have killed her like that, no matter what kind of mistakes she made. Muriang watches and is in awe of the high level Young has reached. Ran smirks as Young is finally showing her true powers. She says, now you must learn. Once you make one or two exceptions, you will have to keep making them. If one has committed a wrongdoing worthy of death, then they must die. Ran continues to say, you'll be able to understand me once you rise to my position one day. Now stop acting like a child and leave the room. And get her body out of my face right away. She says, the hundred flower room originated from the same roots as the Emmy sect. So I'll take them in again. Hurt by her master's actions, Young leaves the room. Muryang then realizes Ran may have intended to kill Lady Wu from the start to subdue the Hundred Flower Room. Muryang knows Ran is not only the most powerful martial master in Sichuan, she's also very meticulous. He thinks it'll be harder to control her than expected. Ran then calls Muryang and says she needs to mobilize him. Muryang and Daioshi both worry as to why. Ran says she wants the Black Cloud Core to hunt Wool down for her. Later on, we see two disciples disposing of Lady Wu's body. They decide to leave her in the middle of the forest where stray animals could eat her up. They leave her for a brief moment before someone approaches the body. It's Wool. He gathers some rocks to bury her properly. He sits with her body for a moment and says, He won't apologize since they were just making use of each other. But he promises to make sure to avenge her and make those who did this to her pay. Bereavement. It's used to describe the most horrible kind of feeling of loss in the world. The sadness of a parent losing their child. In the Ching Ching sect, Ha knocks on the door of Jin's home. Jin's manager asks Ha what he needs. Ha asks to see Jin. He tells the manager that the Ching Ching sect is in a precarious situation now and they need his help. The manager understands and goes back inside to get Jin. Ha is left to think. After Wu Gun Sing got assassinated, Jin gave up everything and decided to isolate himself in his home. It's as if this worn down house reflects the state of Jin's heart. After a few moments, Jin opens the front door and greets Ha. Ha asks Jin how he's been. Jin says he's getting along alright and invites everyone inside. They get each other up to speed and Ha tells Jin the assassin who killed the Thunder Clan's young leader used the 72 sword waves technique. The same technique that killed his son. Ha tries to muster up the strength to ask Jin a question, but Jin interrupts him and says he knows why he's here. The assassin who killed the Thunder Clan's young leader is the same assassin who killed my son, he says. Ha asks if that's true, what are you going to do about it? 
Jen begins to say, parents who lose their children live a lifeless life. So obviously, I'll avenge my son. On this day, Jin's feelings of bereavement turned into fury. Back in Chengdu, Wo stands at the well, practicing with his daggers. But as he's training, he hears someone approaching. He turns and sees Rainju. She tells him he's become more handsome since the last time they met. Rainju says she was wondering where Wo has been. She didn't expect him to be right under the Hundred Flower Room's nose. Wool asks what she wants. He knows, since she came with people, she doesn't just want to catch up. Dayoshi and Hayu greet Wool and are impressed with Wool's senses. Ranju says this is Wool's last chance to join the Black Cloud Corps. Wool asks what will happen if he refuses. Ranju says then they'll have to do as per their client's request. The request to kill him. But of course, they begin bickering on what to do. Wo then asks if they're going to retract the mission. Daioshi tries to negotiate and says he already knows who Wo is and what he does. He says Wo just needs to hide himself better than he is right now. He continues and says they already told the Emisec that Wo has been killed and if Wo were to get caught later on, they just need to cover it up. Even if the Emisec finds out Wo is alive, he'd have grown so much that no one in Sichuan will be able to take him on. Daioshi then informs Wool that their client is the Emi sect, even though Wool probably already realized that. Wool asks Daioshi, is it alright for you to betray your client so easily? Isn't credibility everything to a vagrant group? Daioshi laughs and says, who cares about credibility nowadays, especially with everything that's going on in Chengdu. He says he doesn't not like Wool and he doesn't want to kill him. He just wants him to join the Black Cloud Corps. Wool takes a second and refuses. Since credibility is important to an assassin, he says. Assassins and credibility, Ranju thinks. She wonders if this means someone hired him to do all those things in Chengdu. Wool reflects on why he's done what he's done. He remembers his fallen friend Min's last words. I hope those people will experience the same emotion I feel. This horrifying helpless feeling of being crushed by a stranger that you can't go against. Then it hits Rainju. Your client is a woman, isn't it? She asks. She says there can only be one reason why a man would charge into a fire like a moth. It's when they're involved with a woman. Daioshi says, ah, a woman. You're more sentimental than you seem. Rainju asks what kind of woman she is. She demands to know this instant and sends an attack right past Wool. The explosion sends fragments everywhere, providing a nice distraction. When they look back, Wool is gone. Then, Marian comes out of hiding and asks, didn't I tell you that talking to him would be futile? Muriang points out that Wool is standing on the roof, standing in the open. Muriang gives the order to kill Wool. Out come Muriang's men and they surround Wool. Wool snaps his fingers and clears them all with his soul reaping thread. You sure brought a lot of people to kill just one person, Wool says. Muriang says he was wondering if he should have brought more. He's brought an entire army to kill Wool. You guys should have never gotten involved in my war, Wool says. The story continues with two men conversing. Then suddenly, there's a bunch of commotion and they wonder what's going on. They see Wool being chased by the Black Cloud Corps. They wonder why Wool is being chased because they've never seen him before. The men are not sure if Wool is running for his life or he's just running with his subordinates. Wool catches a glimpse of them and comes up with a new plan. He changes directions and heads right for the two men. Wool surprisingly takes out one of the men. The other man begins yelling at Wool, questioning his actions. Wool answers by taking his life as well. The other innocent bystanders gather around Wool and think he's crazy. The Black Cloud Corps finally catch up to Wool and wonder what he's doing. Wool looks back at them as his plan is working. The bystanders start asking why they're killing people recklessly. Ranju and the Black Cloud Corps have been set up by Wool. The bystanders are ready to fight the Black Cloud Corps as they think they are associated with Wool. Daioshi and Rainju now understand they've been played. Wool was able to slow the Black Cloud Corps down and he takes off, leaving them to fight the bystanders alone. Rainju tries to explain, but Hayu steps up and says he'll take care of the bystanders. Hayu tells Rainju and Daioshi to keep pursuing Wool. Rainju and Daioshi take off and they tell Hayu he better survive. Hayu says that's an order he will follow. Muryang, Rainju, and Daioshi were able to catch up to Wool. They're on a rooftop observing the war. Both sides are fighting their hardest to kill each other. Willing to go to extreme measures, neither sect will stop until the end. 
Muryang is astounded that one assassin was able to fool all of Chengdu from turning a small battle into a full-scale conflict. Muryang asks Wool if he even knows what he's doing. Wool asks if everyone is out now, even those who are hiding. He says, although the results are a bit different from what he thought, it seems to be better than he ever imagined thanks to the Black Cloud Corps. Wool thanks them and says, the battlefield is about to become even more beautiful. Rangu has heard enough and draws her weapon. She sends an attack at Wool that he dodges. Daioshi decides to join in and draws his weapon as well. Let's put an end to things here, he says. Daioshi sends an attack at Wool that he also dodges. Wool activates his soul reaping thread and sends daggers right at Daioshi. Daioshi is worried as Wool has finally stopped running and is finally fighting back. Daioshi is amazed at the movement of Wool's daggers. Daioshi defends as best as he can but Wool is done messing around. He sends a dagger from behind Daioshi and cuts his arm off. Daioshi unleashes a painful scream and Wool surrounds Ranju with additional daggers. She can't believe she can't see the daggers because of how fast they're moving. Ranju can tell that Wool is acting differently than he did when he was fighting O. Wool is serious this time. When Ranju looks up, she sees Wool looking down on Daioshi. She yells for Wool to stop, but he doesn't give her any attention. As Wool stares at Daioshi, ready to end his misery, Muryang jumps in and fires his spear at Wool. As the spear makes its way to Wool, Wool grabs Daioshi and uses him as a shield. Muryang's attack has just impaled Daioshi. Wool looks at the wounded Daioshi and takes off. Ranju runs to Daioshi and begs him not to die. Losing consciousness, Daioshi says he's not going to die. Ranju, in tears, yells for Muryang to go after Wool. She says to catch him and rip him to shreds. Muryang is determined to avenge Daioshi and takes off. From afar, Ran is observing the war with Young and the Emi sect. Young says they need to quickly rescue their ally, the Qing Ming sect, and stabilize the current situation as soon as possible. Ran agrees as the situation is worse than she thought. Ran orders everyone to advance into the Fire Dragon Room. At the Fire Dragon Room, they get a knock from Ran and the Emmy sect. The Fire Dragon Room Master, Pio, knows they'll be at a disadvantage if they open the door. Out of patience, Ran breaks the door down. Pio calls her a witch. Ran doesn't appreciate the name calling. Pio tells Ran to have her people stand down. This is a problem between the Fire Dragon Room and the Ching Ming sect. He says it's no place for the Emi sect to butt in. Ran says everyone knows how the Ching Ming sect and the Emi sect are related. And when Pio tries to respond, Ran tries to silence him. But Pio was ready. As Pio defends, he realizes he didn't know Ran was this strong. Ran has had enough and jumps up to deal her final blow. She says, with this, it's over. But right before she can deal the final blow, the Ching Cheng sect's greatest warrior Mew blocks the attack. Ran can't believe her powerful attack was stopped. She looks at Mew and says, long time no see. Mew says to think they'd meet like this again. Ran says she's not happy to see him. Mew says he waited seven years to come face to face with Ran. He says if his senior brothers had not rejected his proposal to obliterate the Emi sect seven years ago, they'd have met much sooner. Ran recognizes Mew's energy. I guess you've obtained some enlightenment in recent times. I can feel a mysterious energy from you that I hadn't seen before, Ran says. Mew says, I simply learned some new martial arts. Ran says, she can't possibly dare to imagine just how extensive and deep the martial arts of the Ching Cheng sect are. Even so, she's quite confident that she knows enough about the Ching Cheng sect's martial arts. She could never have dreamed that the Ching Cheng sect had hidden a martial art that would exude such impure energy. Mew tells her not to measure the Ching Cheng sect with her own measurements. What Ching Chang is capable of is far greater and vast than that of the Emi sect. I guess you're so great that even a mere assassin could make a fool out of you, Ran asks. Mew asks what she means by assassin. Ran informs Mew that the assassin he took down in the underground cave is still alive. Ran then asks if she checked his corpse. Mew realizes he didn't. Ran says this is why such a situation has occurred. Mew then asks if he's really alive. Ran says he's the main culprit who killed the young leader of the Thunder Clan and caused all of this. The one who killed Zhang Hua of our sect and Chang of your sect. It was all him. Mew asks if Ran is saying that they're being played by a mere assassin. Ran says that's right. She says let's settle the problem between us after we take care of him first. There's no telling what he's plotting at this very moment. But Mew refuses. He prepares for battle and says, The one who ordered the assassination of Wu Gun Sang is standing right in front of me. He does not want to miss this golden opportunity. 
He says the seven swords of the Ching Chang are to help the Fire Dragon Room to drive away the Wicked Witch of the Emmy Sect. As Ran faces an army, she says he's chosen the hard way out. Pay for your crimes with your death, Muse says. They face off and charge each other. And not far away, we see Wool stop running. He looks out into the distance to see Mew and Ran fighting. And Wool can't help but smirk. Later on, Wool continues to run. Murian can't believe that he's having a hard time catching up even on a horse. He wonders if Wool is producing threads with energy and then stepping on them in mid-air. Regardless of whatever method Wool is using, Murian is determined to catch up to him and kill him. He then gets a flashback to his younger years. The first time he met Daioshi. He is still hurt that Wool killed him. Daioshi was like his teacher. Muryang calls for an attack and the Black Cloud Corps unleash their spears at Wool. Wool senses the spears and turns back towards them. They are questioning why Wool is running towards the spears like a madman. And right before their eyes, Wool disappears. As they look around to see where he could have went, Wool pops up right above them. When they look up, Wool unleashes his attack. Muryang has been outplayed by Wool yet again. Wool is done running though. He's circled in by Muryang and the Black Cloud Corps. Muryang says he will make sure to kill him with his own hands. Wool replies and says he doesn't understand. He asks, isn't this how everyone lives? Isn't this what the Jang Hu is like? You, the Ching Chang sect, the Emi sect? All of you kill people, all the time. How are you guys different than me? How many people do you think the Ching Chang sect and the Emi sect have sacrificed in order to get the reputation they have now? Wool looks at the Black Cloud Corps and asks, what about you guys? In order to maintain such a huge organization of vagrants, I'm sure you have killed at least 10 times more people than the number of people you have here. Wool says he simply created an opportunity here. He then asks, isn't the reason that the situation is in this state is because all of your greed and ambition? Irate, Muryang says Wool has really lost his mind. Muryang then gets a closer look at Wool's dagger. He thinks it's shining more than it was before. He wonders if Wool infused energy into his weapon to make it shine. Muryang then questions what Wool could gain from revealing his own weapon. Then, Muryang senses people approaching. Based on their energies, he can tell one of them is definitely Ran, the Emi sect leader. But he can't figure out who the other person is with a similar sized energy. He knows Wool has always worked alone, so there's no way they could be his allies. We then see it's Mew, the Ching Ching sect's greatest warrior, chasing after Ran. As they fight above Wool and Muryang, they notice Wool's dagger. They stop their fight and wonder what it is and what's going on. Young also notices who it is. As they run over, Ran asks Young if she knows who that is. Young says that's the assassin, Wool. Assassin, Mew thinks. His attention is now on Wool. He can't believe he's actually alive. Mew unleashes a loud yell that pierces everyone's hearing. Mew jumps down and Wool is excited. Everyone's finally gathered, he says to himself. But they don't know, Wool has a plan. The chase continued as everyone tried to keep up with Wool. Tired of chasing, Mew asks Wool how long he intends to run. Young consents something is off. She tells Ran that they need to stop. She knows they must be playing into Wool's hands. But Ran's tunnel vision tells Young to shut up. No one knows because Ran didn't show it, but she was overwhelmed by Mew's martial art. She's annoyed that Wool is acting up right in front of her and she must not let him live. If Wool survives, it will destroy the Emisect's reputation that is already on the brink of falling. And though it was only for a second, she was pushed back by Mew. She thinks she needs to kill Wool in order to have a real fight with Mew. Then, suddenly, out come dozens of arrows. They are being ambushed by hidden weapons. Muryang questions where they are as there are traps everywhere. Muryang realizes that they are at the Tang Clan estate. Wool led them to the Tang Clan village. The village of his pal, Sochu. Mew is furious to have been led there. Then, Wool appears on the rooftop. Mew and Wool lock eyes. Then, Ran interrupts and asks Wool what he's up to. Wool says, sear this into your eyes. This is his inescapable net trap. Then, one of the Black Cloud Corps members tries to sneak up on Wool. As he goes in for an attack, Wool sends the hidden daggers his way. The member is able to defend a few, but gets too cocky. More hidden daggers fly out, and these surprise him. He fights off a few more, but ultimately, he's no match. Other disciples complain about the hidden weapons, but they believe it should have been expected in a place like the Tang Clan village. Wolf smirks as he recalls the secret Sochu informed him of. Sochu also told him there are hidden weapons with extreme venom. 
The Emisec disciples begin panicking and Young tries to calm them all down. But it's too late as more hidden arrows come flying out. They begin taking the disciples out and Young warns them not to move recklessly. As one disciple tries running away, she steps on a pressure plate. The plate has released poisonous gas. Then, out come a swarm of snakes. Ready to put an end to this madness, Rand demands Wool to come down. She wants to rip his head off. Wool says, wait, the best is saved for last. But not willing to wait is Mew. As snakes approach him, he blows their heads off. He tells Wool he is the one who clipped the Ching Chang sex wings. He's ready to make him pay with his life. Pay with my life? Wool asks. Didn't you already make me pay for it seven years ago? Wool says he no longer has any debts to pay in this rotten world. All that's left is to collect debts. Wool jumps off the roof and heads right towards Mew. Wool is prepared to go face to face with Mew. Mew tells Wool he's changed much since they last met. Everything except for those eyes. Wool tells Mew he's still the same except for his eyes. Mew draws his sword and tells Wool he won't let him get away this time. Mew draws his Azure Cloud Crimson Dawn Slash and prepares the attack for Wool. Wool also prepares for battle and charges right at him. Wool sends his daggers right at Mew who successfully defends. Mew is impressed and says, Wool is no longer just an ordinary assassin. The two battle and Mew wonders what kind of seven years it's been for Wool. His techniques are sharper than any martial master within the Sichuan province. Mew is enjoying the challenge. It's been a long time since he's tried so hard to win. Mew stops and says, alright. He powers up and sends Wool a final threat. Let's see if you can stop this, he says. As Mew rushes in, Wool is prepared. The two clash and Mew felt something. He knows Wool won't escape unscathed upon receiving this attack. He's sure it will split Wool in half. But as the attack settles, Wool is seen holding Mew's blade with his two fingers. Mew is stunned. Wool squeezes his two fingers together and begins shattering Mew's blade. Wool is ready to show Mew what happened in that snake pit. Wool activates Jade Destruction, shattering Mew's sword. Mew is distraught. That sword has been passed down from his master for generations. It has never even been scratched after a fierce fight. How? Mew yells. Then to everyone's surprise, a blade is sent right through his chest. But it wasn't from Wool. Ran has stabbed Mew in the back. Mew turns to Ran and she tells him that he did great. And she says now she will take over and finish Wool herself. Mew spits out some blood and stands up. He can't believe Ran struck him from behind. Ran says, so what? Everyone in the Jenghu only recognizes the victor. You should blame yourself for being unable to dodge my attack. Mew says to Ran, you're the sect leader of the Emi sect. You should be ashamed of what you just did with everyone watching. Ran says they only saw one thing here. The moment that the Emi sect, the final victor, began its rule over the Sichuan province. Even if they saw something else, they'd only be able to talk about it in the afterworld. Mew yells and asks if she really thinks the Emi sect will go on. The Emi sect is weakening and it's all because of you, he says. Ran asks if he's done talking. She attacks him once again and says, he should just focus his worries on the Ching Chang sect, because she'll be making the Emi sect last forever. As the Ching Chang sect that has lost their pillar, known as Mew, will pathetically fall apart. Mew has fallen and the Ching Chang sect disciples are at a loss for words. Ran then turns to look at Wool. She says she's thankful to a certain extent. They did cause a great stir and it was thanks to Wool's contribution that an unthinkable opportunity was created. As thanks for that, she says, I'll grant you pain that you won't forget even in death. As the two face off, Wool says, if it weren't for your greedy ambitions, I'd have just lived as a normal person wandering the world. I truly would have preferred to live my life as a normal person. However, your greedy ambitions made me into an assassin. Wool begins to charge at Ran and says, Look at me. See how horrible the monster you've created is, and how great it's become. They clash and exchange heavy blows. Young fears for her master, but Ran giggles. She tells Wool he has no chance of winning at this level. She draws her golden rampant strike and fires at Wool, generating a huge explosion that Wool tries to withstand. Wool stands tall and draws his soul-reaping thread. 
Ran tries to attack but is now being overpowered by Wool. Ran breaks through and asks Wool if that's all he has. Wool stares down and says, let's find out. He sends his soul reaping thread through the ground and grabs a hold of Ran's leg. Ran knows she's in trouble now as Wool charges her with his swift mind and black lightning attack activated. He thinks if he uses swift mind to increase his ability to think quickly to the maximum and black lightning to increase his physical abilities to the maximum, he can move at the speed of sound. Wool sends Ran flying back and he stands over her as she lays helpless. Young cries out for her master as she crawls on the ground. What just happened, Ran thinks. She doesn't know what just hit her. She didn't even see Wool's attack. To think she'd be brought down in a single attack. Ran ponders if it was truly not a fluke that he fought on par with Mew the Chain Chang Sex Greatest Warrior. She asks herself what kind of monster did they create. At this rate, she knows she'll die just like Mew. Ran calls for Young and Meryang. She orders them to kill Wool. They clearly fear the challenge, but they won't turn Ran down. How unsightly, Wool says. You want to sacrifice the lives of two people just to save your own. Do you think I'll let such a chance go? He asks. Wool rushes her again. He zooms right past Mer Yang and is headed right towards Young and Ran. As Ran fears for her life, Mer Yang tries to attack Wool from behind. Wool notices and activates his soul reaping thread, sending a dagger right at Mer Yang. The dagger grazes Mer Yang and he thinks it was a shallow attack. But more daggers are headed his way and this time he's hit. Mer Yang falls to the ground as Wool continues charging at Ran. But now, in his way, is Young. She sends an attack and commands Wool to stop. Wool dodges the attack and sends Young another, this time grazing the cheek of Wool. But Wool doesn't stop and runs right past Young without a counter. She is shocked Wool didn't retaliate. Young doesn't understand why. Wool reaches Ran and looks down on her. As he looks down, she calls him a bastard. Young knows what's about to happen and yells for Wool to stop. For his final attack, Wool transforms himself into a snake and swarms Ran. When Ran opens her eyes, Wool has dropped her in a pile of snakes. Ran looks up at Wool and says, If it wasn't for you, Sichuan would have been mine. Finally, Wool drops down and puts an end to Ran. He then stands over the lifeless Ran and asks if that's all she had to say for her last words. For his last words, he tells her to disappear from his life forever. Wool looks down at Ran as the Blood Shadow group has finally been avenged. Young and Mer Yang are unsure of what to expect next, and the Chin Cheng sect disciples refuse to leave their fallen master's side. The two sides stop fighting as they can't believe Ran is actually gone. They all wonder who Wool is and where he came from. They question if he's even human because he defeated Ran so easily. Wool then remembers everyone is watching. When he turns to the disciples, they scream and fall to the ground. There's no way they can defeat him, they think to themselves. One of the disciples gets so scared she runs away. Young knows they're all screwed. Everyone has been overwhelmed by Wool. The assassin everyone hated cut down the leaders of the Emi sect and the Chain Chang sect in an instant. He has taken total control over Sichuan. Young wonders what's the best option for the Emi sect going forward. As she thinks, Wool turns to face her and they lock eyes. As Young nervously says Wool's name, she's interrupted by a loud yell. Back from the dead is Mew, the Chain Chang sect's greatest warrior. He jumps up and is filled with rage. Young and Wool look back and wonder how this could be. Mew shouts and is ready for his rematch with Wool. The disciples try to ask Mew if he's alright because of his new intimidating appearance. The disciples are almost certain that the ominous energy coming from Mew is demonic. They can't believe Mew has learned demonic arts. Mew rushes towards Wool and he can tell that his movements are completely different. Wool thinks Mew's movements feel similar to his. The Ching Chang sect disciples beg Mew to stop out of fear, but he doesn't listen. Wool can tell Mew is way faster than earlier and there aren't any gaps in his movements. Wool also questions if Mew has learned demonic arts. But Wool knows Mew is not in the right state of mind. The demonic energy has taken over. Wool activates his soul reaping thread and aims daggers at Mew. Wool initiates and gets a hold of Mew. Mew rages and falls to the ground. Even with his newly learned skills, Mew was no match for Wool. Mew begins to lose consciousness again and coughs up blood. And just like that, Mew falls to Wool yet again. As Wool looks down on Mew, someone approaches Wool. It's Ha of the Ching Chang sect. Without saying a word, he asks Wool to stop. Ha looks back at Mew and hears him grunting. Ha rushes to check up on him and he coughs up more blood. 
Mew begins to talk and says, Hey. Ha interrupts and asks why he learned demonic arts. With his last words, Mew says, Everything was for the sake of the Ching Chang sect. Ha says to the slain Mew that was so foolish, The honor of the Ching Chang sect that he tried so hard to protect has now been lost because of those demonic arts. Mew should have never taken the book of the Nine Demon School from the underground cave. With Ran and Mew both gone, the disciples stand cluelessly. Mew of the Ching Chang sect learned demonic arts and Ran of the Emi sect had cowardly stabbed the Ching Chang sect in the back. They can't believe they still couldn't take down one assassin after doing all of that. The flow within Sichuan will be changed from today onwards. And it's all because of one assassin. As the dust settles, Wu assesses the damage. Ha has nothing to say and looks back down at Mew. Young knows she has to take action and walks towards Wu. Young approaches him and says, Wu, if you allow it, the Emi sect would like to bring the corpse of our sect leader back to Emi Mountain. The Emi sect disciples don't agree with Young's truce, but Young turns to them to shut them up. She faces Wu again and thinks, no one can insist on revenge in this situation. She knows they have to find a way to hold on to life. Then, Ha stands. He says they'd also like to collect Mew's corpse and retreat. Everyone is in shock that Ha, the executive of the Ching Cheng sect, is bowing his head, because continuing a fight that has lost all justification will make it impossible for the two sects to make a comeback. They all wonder if Wu will show them mercy. Wu thinks and says, If I let you go, you'll probably scheme your revenge just like I did back then. Young swears upon her name that the Emi sect will not seek revenge against him. Ha says the same as they will forget all grudges with this. Wu asks how he's supposed to believe them. Young says she'll make it so that he'll believe it. Ha also promises. Wu takes a second again and reviews both offers. He looks out into the sky and his eyes shine bright. Looking for a fresh start, Wu grants them permission to leave. With this incident, all of Sichuan fell into a downturn. The Emi sect and the Ching Chang sect that were fighting so hard over power had stopped their activities. The other sects also closed and locked themselves up and focused on recovering their losses. Numerous people suffered great losses, but not a single one dared to even dream of seeking revenge against Wu, who is a legend known as the Reaper. Thank you for tuning in to Season 1 of this series. To show my appreciation, I went through the comments of this series and picked my favorites to shout out. I definitely didn't expect the series to get as much attention as it did, but I'm grateful that you all enjoyed it so much. And it's crazy that just from this series alone, my audience grew over 15,000 subscribers. So thank you to all of the new subscribers, and also to the ones who have been here since day one of the channel. It was a lot of work replying to every comment, but it was also a lot of fun. You guys really cracked me up with the BK foot lettuce thing, so yes, for those asking, this is my real voice. Everything is 100% done by me. Thanks again for the support, comment if you saw any of your comments in the shoutouts, and feel free to give me any suggestions on what I should recap next. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share this video, and stay tuned for the next series.